Hey everyone, welcome to the very last episode of Game Face for 2018, which really isn't an episode of Game Face at all. It is our best of 2018 awards. We are going to hand out awards in 23 different categories, the most we have ever had in our Game of the Year awards. Can't um, stop, won't stop. Yeah, uh, usually we have like genres that'll leave and then they'll come back. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, we kept all the genres from last year and re-added some that we had not had in the awards yeah, the, for last the year. The spread was actually pretty good this year in yeah. terms of like genre distribution. Absolutely. Uh, we have a ton of content to get to in this show, so I'm not going to mess around with a lot of pleasantries at the beginning. We do have a couple things we got to catch. It's going to be thoroughly unpleasant the entire time. <laughs> not true at all. We do have a couple things we got to get to before we get on with our awards, and that is both of the fantasy leagues that are going on at Sifted right now. Uh, so the first league we're going to talk about is the actual fantasy football league that's going on at Sifted. I gave you an update about this a couple weeks ago. We are headed into the championship this coming weekend. So Sam, bring up the graphic. I am in the championship game. <laughs> first playoff game against Mitch. My team exploded for 154 points. Um, and the other bracket... Oh, take the graphic down there just for a second. The other bracket... It was a close first round playoff game, but uh, Paul Krupka won 140 to 130. And then this weekend, the weekend that just passed, I was playing Robert Diana, who has been in first all season long. And uh, I feel for Robert Diana because he has a team that is very similar to a team that I have in another league. And it was the best team in the league in the other league, and he was the best team in our league. And this weekend of fantasy football, they're calling it Sunday Bloody Sunday, was like the worst week of fantasy football in the history of fantasy football. So a lot of teams won this week that probably didn't have any business winning. Um, I don't know if I would say that about me and Robert. He was definitely better than me, but I had a pretty good team. And because he had such rotten luck this week, I move on to the Sifted Bowl. Uh, and the other bracket, Colin Wallace, also known as Matt Kyle Rocks. He, uh, he had a good team all year. He was in first place from, for a lot of the year. Um, and he beat Paul Krupka uh, by about 30 points. So it is Shane versus Matt Kyle Rocks in the Sifted Bowl for mm. the championship. And I have not won this league. What's your team name? I just use Maybe L.A. Chowderhead. Yeah, mm. Chowderhead is a nickname that people in Pennsylvania gave me years ago. And when I started playing fantasy football back in like 1996, everybody called me that. So I called my league Chowderhead. And now every league I play in, I just use that name. So... I have never won the Sifted Fantasy League. Someone else has won the first two years. I did go to the bowl the first year and lost. Last year, I didn't go to the bowl, or maybe I have them reversed. Either way, I've never won the Sifted Fantasy League, and I have a chance this year against Matt Kyle Rocks. So you guys won't know what happened until we come back from break in January, but when we do, I'll be sure to let you know how it all went down. That was my only chance to win anything fantasy really. That's right. <laughs> and if Matt Kyle Rocks wins, we have a trophy that we send out. And then we also have a plaque where we put the champions on the plaque every year. So whoever wins will get their name put on the plaque and we'll hold the trophy for the next 12 months until a new champ is crowned next year. So before we move on, I just want to say thank you to everybody who played. It was a 12-man league. And like I said last time, pretty much everybody stuck with it all the way to the end. We had like one owner who kind of checked out at the end, uh, but his season, he wasn't going to make the playoffs anyway. So it was a great year, great league. want to thank everybody for participating, but only to stand. And I'm one of them. All right, now let's get on to our video game fantasy league that Matt and I have been going toe-to-toe -to -toe in for the last three years. Or has it been four years for you and I? Three. Three, because the first year was Marcus's Marcus. picks. Yep. And just to refresh your memory, I beat Marcus the first year. Matt has beaten me for the last two years. And now I'm trying to even up my record at two and two with this season. I don't think there's any trying this year. <laughs> so let's bring it up, Sam. The final results of the Sifted Video Game Fantasy League. Um, so... Ultimately, Matt only ever had nine games. Yep. Um, we had two alternates this year, but he had really rotten luck with games yeah, that he dream, drafted. Dreams let me down. Yeah. He had really rotten luck with uh, games that he drafted being pushed out of 2018. Um, I Usually that's my problem. Mm -hmm. And every year before this, I was always the one who never finished with a full, full lineup of games. I did that this year because I played it really conservative. And so I did get 10, 10 games into my team. Um, I finished with 845 points, and Matt finished with 720. Uh, and so there you go. I am the champ once again of the Sifted Video Game Fantasy League. My record's 2-2 two two now. How in the hell is Valkyria Chronicles that close to Spider-Man? Yep. 
Eight, 84 for Valkyria Chronicles. Unbelievable. So some of the scores, Spider-Man got robbed. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. have saved me, but Spider-Man got robbed. It, yeah, it definitely should have scored way higher than that. I don't know why it didn't, but uh, you're right. It sh- I think it should have scored higher than that. Uh, but I am the champion, finally. Good season, Matt. And uh, I'm 2-2 two and two now in the Sitted Fantasy League, and I have an idea for something for next year that I'm not going to spoil. But it might have something to do with one of you guys getting in with Matt and I to compete against Matt and I. Hmm. So, um, again, that's something we'll talk about when we get back for the new year. But there's kind of an unofficial, official, sifted uh, user league that's going on on the site. And the winner of that may or may not make it in to compete with Matt and I. Hmm. So that might be something new going forward. But another great season with Matt. A lot of fun. We'll draft again in January, one of the first episodes we do. Uh, in 2019 and we'll start it all over again so with that it's time to get to the awards people and uh, we're going to kick everything off with the best first person shooter so before we really get into all these i'll give you a quick rundown for some of you maybe weren't patrons last year don't know how we do them Uh, for most awards matt and i just pick a winner Uh, we could if we were to choose like five nominees like we used to choose at game trailers and go through each nominee and then choose a winner we would be here literally like until next week so Matt and I, we, for most categories, we just pick one winner, no runner-up. Mm-hmm. And then for the last three or four categories, we actually do have a runner-up and a winner. But those categories tend to be kind of the bigger ones and the ones you guys probably want to see uh, no- other nominees for. So with that in mind, let's get on with Sifted's Game of the Year Awards for 2018. We're kicking everything off with first-person shooter. Matt, what is your pick for the best first-person shooter of 2018? My pick is Far Cry 5. Very good choice. Uh, eh, the, <laughs> <laughs> really? You don't feel good about that? I feel okay. I mean, the problem became when I sat down to look at this list, I was like, I haven't really played a lot of sh- first-person shooters You this have. Year. I mean, just in general, you've kind of fallen off from first-person yeah. shooters in your playtime just in general. Yeah, it's not a huge multiplayer person. Like, you, you, that kind of, you know, sticks a fork in it to some degree. Um, really, the only two major first-person shooters I played this year were Far Cry 5 and Battlefield. Um, and Battlefield certainly wasn't going to win this. So, yeah, um, yeah Far, Far Cry 5, I didn't think it was a great, the greatest Far Cry game, but uh, I did have a good time playing it. And uh, I always like, I mean, I like all the Far Cry games for the most part, even going back to you know, Far Cry 2 with its annoying re- responding checkpoints. Um, I like the open world thing. I like uh, how most of the guns feel. I am a big fan of bow and arrow crap. Uh, and... Uh, the setting worked pretty well. I mean, we, we went over in the, in the episode at the time over kind of how the story isn't quite as well-formed as it might have been. Yeah, but, they uh, definitely pulled back on yeah. some of the stuff they could have done. But I dug it. I'm looking forward to the, the new one, you know, based on you know, the sequel, more or less, a side story in uh, February. And, uh, yeah. I also almost kind of forgot this was this year. <laughs> it was a long time yeah. ago. Like, yeah, it's one of those games that came out early in the year, but we always say, you know what? We're not going to forget the games that came no. out early in the year, and here we are remembering one of them. Mm-hmm. So I think that's good. I have no problem with someone picking Far Cry 5 for a best first-person shooter. Um, you know, it's... I think in this case this year, it was kind of a tough choice uh, because every game was a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Like, not every game had a campaign this time. Not every game had multiplayer this time. And so you kind of, I think in a lot of cases, you're just going to end up picking something that really resonated with yeah, you. Yeah, it comes down to what you value in, in either a game or at least in a shooter. And to me, I'm more of a, you know, I'm more of a solo experience, sort of like, you know, put me in a world yep. kind of guy when it comes to this stuff. And uh, Far Cry 5 did that the best uh, for, for what you can say. I mean, maybe I could have cheated and said Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't play it in first person, so I felt that that was... Uh, I tried. It made me sick. Yeah, I felt... I, I didn't like it. I, I like to see the animation of Arthur. Um, so I, uh, I I decided not to cheat that way, and I went with Far Cry. Yep. All right. So my pick for the best first-person shooter of 2018 is Call of Duty Black Ops 4. I, I know people who maybe haven't followed me since I've been working on Sifted may be like, of course Shane is picking Call of Duty because he's always loved Call of Duty. But things have been a lot different for me since I started Sifted. I am not like a gigantic Call of Duty fan. I've not been a huge fan of the uh, last few games. And uh, that all changed with Black Ops 4. I should not probably be surprised, though, because typically I am a big fan of Treyarch's Call of Duty games. They tend to be my favorite Call of Duty games. 
For whatever weird reason, I also tend to be the best at them. I don't know what it is about, about Treyarch's games, but I am way better at them than I am at any other Call of Duty games. And I'm sure that played into it at least a little bit for me picking it as my uh, first person shooter of 2018. But Black Ops 4 is a gigantic game. I know a lot of people uh, have made a big stink about the fact that there's no campaign and they kind of swapped out the campaign for Blackout, which is a battle royale mode. Sure doesn't seem to have hurt him at the, at the register. It hasn't hurt him at the register. It didn't hurt him critically either. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the highest reviewed Call of Duties in the last like half decade or three quarters mm -hmm. of a decade. I only played the, I think the alpha or whatever, but I thought the, the Blackout mode was fun. I, I honestly have played very little of the Blackout mode. I played it a ton when I was reviewing it. It's but definitely the most appealing battle royale mode I've played in terms of just polish and and feeling like it's supposed to feel. Um, yeah. I'm certainly no expert on that, but I, I was like, oh yeah, if you're into this, I bet I bet you'll really like it. And sure enough, everyone I know who loves battle royale has almost switched full time to this game. Yeah, and you know, for me, that's just icing on the cake. For a lot of people, that's a good enough reason to buy it yeah. all on its own. Yeah, I. Personally, just keep. I have continued to just keep playing mm -hmm. the multiplayer suite. I and, you're, and you're doing well. I, 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 like I said, I am the best at this franchise, Black Black Ops. For some reason, I have no idea, but I am. Like I can play these games, and I can just kick ass, and I'll have like a KD of like 0.8 in all the other ones. It's very weird. I have not quite <laughs> figured out yet why that is, but um. I am loving Black Ops 4 still. It's the game that I pick up and play when I have like five or ten minutes to spare here and there. I, I mentioned that on a prior episode. Not a thing you can do with Battlefield. No. I have fallen in love with Call of Duty again thanks to Black Ops 4. And when you really start digging into it with all the zombie stuff and the blackout mode, I have not missed the campaign at all. Probably because the last couple campaigns I've played uh, other than Infinite Warfare have been, in my opinion, poor. Uh, so my expectations for single player were already pretty low for this franchise. I haven't really missed it. I feel like the multiplayer is great. The gunplay feels so damn good. Um, I have a feeling I'm going to play this game all year long. And so it is my best first person shooter of 2018. All right. Next up is best multiplayer game. A category that a lot of times is syn synonymous with the prior category. Yeah. Um, but in your case, that's not true, Matt. What is your no. pick for best multiplayer? Uh, well, I had to sit and think also about, like, what have I really played multiplayer this year? Because I haven't played a lot. Yeah. And I ended up settling on uh, Forza Horizon 4, which is probably the game I played the most with other people. It's also a great um, multiplayer. Yeah, they, they finally, I think they finally nailed kind of the mingle player aspect they've been trying to do for like, I think I'd say like the whole series. Or yeah, at least pretty since, much. At least since 2. I mean, you could even um, tack just Forza Motorsport yeah, on that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, teaming up to do like kind of the co-op events is actually pretty cool. It's way better than I thought it would be. Um, it seems kind of... Way better than I thought it yeah, would be. It seems like a silly addition to a driving game, but it, it works. Like it's they fun. really found yeah. a way to make it work. Um, you know, and just every element of, it's not intrusive. Like it doesn't force you to do it, but if, if you want to go and go and do it, like I've never regretted joining a, 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 like a crew, no, not crew, because that's a different game. <laughs> um, I've never regretted joining like uh, you know up with with like a club me like club members or just like random people and driving around and doing stuff. It's it works. It's, I, it's really I even cool. like before it even starts when everyone's just gathered together mm -hmm. and there's just like forty cars, just like yeah. almost in like a smash up derby like mosh pit around like the starting grid. Yeah, there's sort of a Fast and Furious like race scene thing going on there yeah it's, it looks cool and and even you know even just sort of the 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 passive multiplayer stuff where you're playing against uh you know the drive guitars of your friends and like they all have different personalities because they're they're drawing from those players yep. uh play styles i c continually get complaints from my friends about how my drive guitar drives because i ram them constantly <laughs> i have no i have no mercy in the passing lane so um uh, yeah, I think I think they nailed it, and uh, for once made me made me kind of understand. I think what they've been shooting for multiplayer wise for like this whole series. Yeah, and uh, it's great. I still this is another game that I still play mm -hmm. uh, from time to time. I'll just boot it up and just jump into the world and just yep. screw around with it for a while. I haven't actually loaded it up since they did. They put the new expansion out, or is that tomorrow? Yeah, it's not out yet. Or, so that's the eighteenth. That's yeah. the eighteenth. That's right. Coming soon. Well, actually, tonight, I think, at midnight, Is right? it tonight? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so it should be out there real soon. Um, great game. Even the base game is just yeah. amazing. I highly recommend it. They always do good it. expansions, though. They do. Yep. Uh, they can't do the weather now, though, because it's actually in no, the base game. No, they actually game. have to do some, they have the <laughs> new terrain. And I hope they do another uh, Hot Wheels thing, because yeah. that was a lot of fun. Yep. 
Uh, okay, so my pick for best multiplayer game does kind of go along with what I was saying when I introed this category. Uh, my best multiplayer game for 2018 is Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Uh, I did consider some other stuff. I considered Forza Horizon as well. Mm. I considered Fortnite. Um, didn't consider PUBG this year, obviously, for <laughs> obvious reasons. I considered you, you and a lot of other people. Yeah, and uh-huh. I, I, con- <laughs> I consider Battlefield Five as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I did. It, I mean, multiplayer is great. Yeah, I, I admit, like uh, I did actually pick up Battlefield Five uh, off the, the the day we talked about it, uh, the week it came out. The chat was talking about it being half off at Target, yeah. so I went to Target that night and I got it for half off and played it a lot. I I like what they did with it. Yeah, um, it's for great. The most part. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but for me, Black Ops 4 ultimately won out because of the mm-hmm. variety. And I know some people will say, but wait a minute. The base game doesn't have as much variety because it doesn't have the vehicles and, and things like that. I prefer my multiplayer games to be a little more bite-sized than mm-hmm. the commitment to Battlefield 5 uh, with something that doesn't always jive with me. It's hard for me to just be like, okay, I'm going to sit down now and dedicate 30 to 45 minutes to playing one match yeah. of multiplayer. I do prefer the kind of the scope and commitment of Battlefield in that regard, but I completely understand why people wouldn't prefer that because it's just a different thing and you start thinking about the zombies you then you start talking about blackout battle royale mm. mode the multiplayer so they've also done a great job with the base multiplayer suite so every time i jump in there's some special kind of spin on just even the core modes so uh team deathmatch they'll just jack up the uh the kill count instead of it being 60 it'll be 100 and that drastically changes how you play the game um, so I have just had a ton of fun with the multiplayer suite in Black Ops 4. I think I'm going to continue to. Uh, when they, I'm, I'm so into the groove on it that when they announce new maps and the maps launch, I'm there that night checking out the new maps. When they launch Nuketown, I spent two hours just playing Nuketown over and over again. And again, they're doing a good job with that stuff because when Nuketown launched, they just had a Nuketown playlist. And you could play Nuketown in several different modes. They've been doing this for a long time, but I've been kind of out of the ecosystem for Call of Duty for the last couple years, and I hadn't really experienced it firsthand. Now that they actually have a game that I like to play, and I'm seeing all their usual plans come into play with something I actually care about, I'm starting to see that they've kind of got it down at this point. So um, I don't think anyone can go wrong with Black Ops 4 if you like first-person shooters. It's a great multiplayer suite, so it wins my award for 2018. Uh, next up, best adventure game. Uh, some people may be confused about what this is. Adventure games for us and for our purposes are walking simulators, first person, walk around, solve puzzles, talk to people, mm-hmm. and then point and click adventure games, the old school sort of third person fixed yeah. camera. And I would say kind of like story heavy, like indie stuff tends yeah. to qualify. Like, That's true. Like something like Night in the Woods yep. is an adventure Absolutely. game, even though it's action yeah, platforming. Yeah, action-y, yeah. Which um, is good so, because that's what something I similar to what I picked as well. Yep. Uh, so, Matt, what did you pick for the best adventure game of so 2018? I, this actually was a pretty crowded category. I thought there was a yeah, lot of good, a lot a lot of of great great games, games this year. In that, yep. in that realm. Uh, but I ended up going with uh, Forgotten Anne. Um, that's the game we've talked about yeah. on the show before. Uh, Forgotten with an O. <laughs> it's with an O for um, some reason. This one, I love the, the art style. I love the animation they did. Uh, I think the, the adventure stuff, the puzzle solving and kind of platforming really works well. The mechan- and, and I love the premise that it's sort of like she's in, this, she's in this world where lost objects end up and they become sentient. And she has a thing on her arm that she lets her draw the life force out of the sentient objects and kill them. And you can use that to solve puzzles in a more brute force manner, or you can do it in a way that doesn't kill anybody, um, which I find an interesting dichotomy because it changes sure. how they see her, especially because she is basically like her and her father like run the the basically rule this place, and she's sort of like the Gestapo of like like she's there. Everyone's afraid of her. She's she basically keeps the the objects in line and under threat of like death of suck. Oh yeah. And, and so she's sort of like a really scary sort of almost Orwellian enforcer character. You would never guess that. No. Looking at the footage. But you yeah. can but you can uh, play her sort of as that or you can play her as softening as the game goes along because you do have control over what she does and her dialogue choices in places. Uh, and over the course of the game, it, 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 you know, basically she and the and the and her father are forcing the objects to build this giant bridge they call it that is going to let them open a portal to go back home. 
and they're essentially they've essentially enslaved an entire dimension to build a po- <laughs> and like it kind of gets in the morality of what what that means and why it matters and does it matter cuz i mean you're talking about socks right. you know yeah. but like it, it's it's just a really interesting premise that i think they realized extremely well it also kind of reminds me of the brave little toaster a little bit which yeah. is a movie i liked as a kid um, and i i just think it's a it's a great idea done really well and uh, I encourage anyone who looks at, looks at it and thinks it looks appealing or thinks that description sounds interesting to give it a try. All right. My pick for the best adventure game of 2018 is something that I just played in the last four days. Same. Um, so <laughs> what happens for me is every year I play all the big stuff because I need to for coverage because that's what people mm. care about and that's what they want to see us talk about. And then I have this window after I finish all the big games of like a week, a week and a half to kind of pick up all the indie stuff. This kind of caught my eye throughout the year, mm. and that's what I've been doing the last four or five days is just playing a ton of indie stuff. And uh, one of the games that I played over the last four days is Return of the Obra Din. You may have heard this game mentioned a little bit on the Game Awards, mm. and I, it was kind of on my radar before because I actually created the game page for this game on Sifted, and I'll, I remember it from the first time I ever set my eyes on it because there's no other game with this art style. It not, kind of, not since Max went to color. Anyway. Right, right. Yeah, so it's uh, it kind of uses like a stipple technique. I'm yeah. sure there are artists out there that'll say, no, it's not stippling. But it, it look, To me, it looks like the old black and white Macintosh. Yeah. You know, I but mean, I think, obviously, it's 3D, and it, you know, they could never run anything like that. But that is what that reminds me of. But I think for the layman, most people would say it uses a stipple art style. So it's, it's like that, or like a, almost charcoal-y in places. Yeah, but you can see the it's stippling really cool. now. Like, they use it for, like, uh, particles and things like that. But anyway, this game is about a ship that went missing back in the 19th century. And you are an investigator trying to figure out exactly what happened and why it went missing. So it's an investigative adventure Mm -hmm. game for the most part. Uh, The writing is great. The investigative stuff is really, really cool. This game really kind of transports you back to another time where things were done differently. You didn't have the internet... Everything has to be done. You're a gumshoe. You're, you're mm-hmm. doing everything by hand. You're doing everything the hard way, everything the long way. You're pouring over like ship logs to figure out who was on the ship, who wasn't on the ship. Uh, so you're using a lot of information like that to help you solve the case. Um, and really, I think another big reason why this, this stuck with me so hard is when I was a kid, I read Moby Dick. And mm-hmm. it was just blew my mind. Like I couldn't, it was like the first good book I really read. Like when I was a kid, you, you get all these corny books that you're, you're given in school or your parents buy for you for Christmas or whatever. Moby Dick was the first real piece of literature I ever read. And the version of Moby it's Dick... impressive. Moby, Moby Dick is a slog. Well, no, they... <laughs> it, it was like a oh, truncated like a, right. version so for... So it, it didn't include, like, the 4,000 pages of, like, whaling description? No, huh? It was just, no, like, no. the actual story? Right, That's, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I didn't read the classic. Mm. I read, like, the version for, like, teenagers, even okay. though I was younger than that. But the, book, the Moby Dick book that I had had these amazing illustrations in it mm. that looked almost identical to this game. Like an it, etching. It used, thing, like, yeah. cross-hatching and stippling. And for me, those images in that book brought the book to life. It, I ma- think I it know told the, me what Ahab looked like. I think I know the edition you're talking about, okay. actually. I think I remember. I, I've seen something like that. I had something like that. But it stuck with me. And so years and years, even in my 20s, if somebody would have asked me what my favorite book was, I would have said Moby Dick because of that book and how it stuck with me and everything about this. And there's also, there's, there's one of my favorite bands from when I was that age was a band called Big Country and their first album, uh, The Insert, was also art that looks exactly like mm-hmm. this. So for yeah. some reason, this style, it just, it resonates with me, it sticks with me. And above and beyond that, it's a great a, adventure game. In a big country, dreams stay with you. That they do, in fact. <laughs> Apparently, books stay with you as well. So that's it. My pick for best adventure game of 2018, Return of the Obra Dinn. I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in games like yeah, this. I, I played it for this for the first time this week as well in the same, same reason. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did notice it when it came out. I was like, "Ooh, what's that?" Because like yeah. I love I love old uh, you know the old Mac games. It's what I used to play in the, in the computer lab when people weren't looking. Yeah. Uh, and it reminded me of because of the the maritime theme. It reminded me of Sid Meier's Pirates oh, yeah? that I used to play on the, that Mac yeah. Plus all the, the time. The OG Pirates. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, "Ooh, look at that!" And it's, but yeah, I, I wish I'd played it sooner. Um, yeah. Ignoring it was stupid because it it, you know, it was. It flew way under the radar. It though. did. It did. But it was. They like, only ever put out one trailer for the game. Hmm. 
Oh, I never heard of it until I saw it. it popped up on Steam. And the only reason I noticed is because it was, while it was going through that kind of that top slot on Steam, I'll, you you see that art style, and you're like, what the hell is that? Yeah, like, I've yeah. never seen anything Catch like your that. Catches your eye. Yeah. Um, same reason I saw Aztez yeah, yeah. last year. Yeah, it was, it's like, right. oh, what's that? Like it pops at you. Yep. But yeah, this was really good. It wasn't you know, Forgotten Anne kind of jumps out at me in the same way that like you know things in my childhood sort of like remind it reminds me of those things, and that's what like really endeared it to me. Um, but yeah, this is, I, I think this return to Oberdin, and I'm not done with it, but I think already I'm willing to call it a must play. There you go. Um, it's, it's so good. Yeah. And I can see why people have been kind of trying to bump it. Uh, yeah. This it award season. Yeah. Because absolutely more people should play this thing. Hopefully they get it on the consoles. Or you can probably just wait after you, you're going to get a ton of big games here in like a week. Yeah. And this so is, after um, you get done with those, you're, this game will probably go on sale yeah. and you'll be able to get it cheaper. Only, like full price is only like 20 bucks. Yeah, yeah. It's not much. Um, and it's, it's the guy who did Papers, Please, yep. I think. Yeah. yeah. So again, you know. The pedigree's there. Yep. So you know the writing's going to be great. And, mm. Yeah. So there you go. Well, let's move on to our next category, with, which is Best RPG. So before we, we share our winners for this, Matt has a bit of a different interpretation of what makes an RPG yes. and what doesn't. Um, and so it's going to affect this category and another one a little yes. later on. But uh, and now... No, no spoilers. Yep. But... Yep. And so I'll just let you explain it. Matt, what is your pick for... Well, actually, you're going to wait till I make my pick and then you'll explain your perspective. Yes. But what's your pick for best RPG of 2018? My pick for best RPG, and this is an increasingly annoying category to me because it's getting to the point where I think they should be separated between action RPG and regular RPG. But in the end, I landed on uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey because anything I play for 110 hours is but probably, it must so be pretty probably good. something I like. <laughs> yep. Um, I really like, I mean, I liked Origins already, but I think Odyssey brings all these disparate pieces of Origin together into something that feels like a more complete game. Yeah. In a way, it feels like this is the finished game and Origins was like the, the beta a little bit. Um, I love Cassandra. I think she's a great character. Uh, I enjoyed being her and kind of deciding how she'd react to things because she has kind of a sardonic element to her that I think uh, is kind of the watch, the, the hallmark of all the best uh, Assassin's Creed heroes because uh, Ezio kind of had that too. Ezio, yeah. Every once in a while you need these Assassin's Creed protagonists to sort of look around and be like, everything that's happening now is ridiculous. Yeah. Because you know, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just, I had a great time wandering through the world. I have a great time playing the various missions and meeting all the weird historical characters. I love their take on Socrates, which yeah. is one of the, I mean, it is not... As far as we know, compl historically inaccurate to say that <laughs> Socrates was very annoying. Yeah. Because um, anyone who asks questions all the time like that is going to get on your nerves. There's, I don't think there's an actual, like, you know, I don't think they actually say that in any of the old uh, written, you know, I don't think uh, Herodotus ever actually says he <laughs> yeah. was annoying. But probably didn't, you know, pr they probably didn't mind putting him to death in part because of, I mean, they got him for corruption of youth, but really it might have just been asking too many stupid questions. But, um... It just doesn't stop, but at the same time, it, I don't get sick of it. Um, I would probably still be playing it. I played this game so long. Yeah, I mean, so I, long. I still, I'm up to, up to how, what, 100, 100, over 100 hours, probably close to 110. <laughs> I still haven't been to Sparta. Wow. Like, I'm, st I'm, I'm, st I'm still parts of the map I haven't gone yeah, to because I'm just busy doing everything. And uh, I, I dig it. I love it to death. Yeah, I really um, enjoyed it too. I'm glad they're taking a year off. Because yep. I feel like they've sort of nailed this formula, and it's the the next step is to, for me, the next step is to really bump the writing and the narrative because they've got a good framework here, but they just aren't writing on the level of something like say Witcher Three. And then they just you know? hired Mark Laidlaw, so and so yeah, they, uh, they, they seem <laughs> perfect to, timing. Yeah, we seem to be on the same page, Ubisoft yep. and me. Um, yeah, I, I love it, and uh, even as someone who's loved the Assassin's Creed game since the beginning, um, you know. When you completely reinvent something that you, if some, when they completely reinvent something you love, it doesn't always mean you're going to get on board with it because it's not what you liked yep, before, absolutely right? Absolutely true. But I, it's, they, I got no complaints about any of what they're doing with the series right now. I think they're completely on the right track, and I'm glad they did that. I'm glad they've they've changed it the way they did because I think I don't think I could have taken another, <laughs> another no, one would, of those last. I wouldn't ones. have continued playing this no. franchise if it didn't evolve. And uh, just, you know, the, the action RPG thing is just getting out of hand at this point. I think, you know, everyone wants to make their game an action RPG. Because they're the, um, it's the genre that sells. Yeah, and just cr you're just cramming RPG elements into everything, sort of yeah. like the, I mean, there's even Call of Duty at this point, you know? Yeah. It's been for a while. But, like, 
I think they nailed sort of the, you know, the action part's good, the RPG part, you know, the, the combat and all that really works, and the climbing and everything, and the RPG part works, because I feel like I have control over how she's built, what, you know, what the, you know, what the, you choose in your skill trees really changes how the combat functions. Yeah, absolutely. And you get the Mass Effect style options of how to choose how to respond to things, so yeah. I, I appreciate that. Um, that actually had impact. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it all it all comes together real well. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't have as in, much impact as something like in The Witcher Three, but I think that's what I mean when I say they yeah, step the narrative game up next time. Yep. But uh, everything else pretty 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 on target, boys. Yeah, they did. Boys a great and girls job. up at, up in uh, Ubisoft country. Well done. Yep, they did a great job on Odyssey, without a doubt. And my pick for the best RPG of 2018 is God of War. And this is where Matt and I kind of diverged a little bit. He wasn't comfortable calling God of War an RPG. I was. And so Matt mm. did not consider God of War for this category. No. And yeah, I, I did. I'll tell you my runner-up for this category, though, is Dragon Quest Eleven. That's... Which, which is... Uh, Surprising. Which is a strange... Uh, but like, it's more traditional. More traditional. It's, it's, it was a, because it's the kind of thing. It's like, do I like Assassin's Creed or do I like Dragon Quest? I don't know. They say, they're so disparate. It's hard yeah, to... Yeah. It's like it's like uh, you know you mush, mush those two to get action RPG and regular RPG together. I'm I'm sitting here comparing Diablo two and Baldur's Gate two, and I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, like for um, Dragon Quest is one of those things. I just kept going back and playing it and like wasting t like just to chill. Yeah. I don't, I don't know yeah, what else yeah. how else to say it. But that's I know? mean with games like that you can chill yeah. playing them. You don't have to be engaged and like on it like twenty four yeah. seven. God of War, I just, I don't feel it's an action RPG. Like, it's, uh, and I couldn't find anything online that said, it, that disagreed with me. Uh, it's listed as action adventure on Sony's own site, on uh, Wikipedia, everywhere. I just feel like if you're going to be an RPG, you have to have more emphasis on the development of the character in terms of their abilities and in terms of the level being tied to that. And God of War is so much about, like, collecting the various forms of currency all your character progression, for the most part, comes from uh, upgrading your gear. Um, and, like, the skill tree in it is more about expanding combos. And I just think it's, it's, it's an action game. It's an action-adventure game to me. Especially because the narrative and cinematic element of it um, gives you no player control. Like, I don't get to choose how Kratos reacts. I don't get to make any dictation about what kind of a character he is. So, to me, it's more of just a cinematic action game. Not, not, I shouldn't say just. It's, I'm not saying it's like a lesser game because it's not. I don't think of it as an action RPG. It just doesn't. It just doesn't match that criteria for me in a way that, like, say, Horizon Zero Dawn did, because the skill tree in that was so robust in terms of deciding how you attacked things and how you fought things, and you, I still could control how Aloy interacted with the world with the dialogue trees and stuff. Um, so that was that's pretty much my distinction, and I realize that kind of that is getting more and more. Blurry. It's really hair splitting. I mean, yeah. and actually like. <laughs> But it's getting more and more blurry, but I still think it's a distinction that, that makes sense for this game. I'll tell you what game I have a harder time, like, finding the edge on is Spider-Man. Sp really? Spider-Man I find to be more of an action RPG in the wow. sense, in the sense yeah, that... I would not agree with that In the at sense all. that the skill tree and the upgrades are much more tied to experience points from combat, and then they change how you fight as Spider-Man. But at the same time, it's I so oriented... I the same oriented. thing happens in God of War, though. Not to the same degree. Uh, and We've had this, this discussion before during the game, of, and you keep moving the goalposts. So last year it was the character needed to level. Well, that's just an example. I, see, I think you just see numbers and a sword, and you say it's an action no, RPG. No, I mean, I'll tell you what usually is kind of the tipping point for me, and that's like skill trees. If there's skill trees mm -hmm. in the game, then typically I feel like it's, a, it's an action well, RPG. Well, then ratchet and clank up your arsenal as an R RPG. How? Because you have skill trees on the weapons that you gain... By uh, by shooting things and gaining experience with each weapon, your character doesn't level up though. No, but your guns do. Yeah, but so, I, I, that's but what the I guns said, are more important than the character. You have to have a skill tree, and your character has to level up. Yeah, I just don't buy it. Like, and again, I I I, I did some digging at, when we talked about it just to make sure, and like, I can't find anyone who terms this game an action RPG. Well, action RPG is a term that is not used a lot. Like, Although, well, if you go to the Wikipedia article for uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the first thing it says is, is it is Assassin's Creed Odyssey is an action role-playing yeah, game. Yeah, I'm not going to rely on Wikipedia to decide things. Oh, like I will, because <laughs> I'm not have you ever seen it. Wikipedia editors go at it over a video game's genre? It lasts uh, I weeks have, I times. haven't, but I, I don't care. There, there really is don't. nowhere anywhere that's listed as that. IGN listed as action, Best Buy listed but as action again, IGN doesn't even have action RPG, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Like, uh, most of the places don't even have that designation. 
PlayStation. Well, we don't have Action RPG either. We just called it an RPG. No, I mean, I'm saying on the website. Mm-hmm. Like, IGN doesn't have a genre called action RPG. They don't even have it. We do. That's one, way to, Sony that's one solution. I Sony guess. doesn't call any of its games action RPGs. Mm-hmm. None of them. Like, they're called, they just call them It's kind of like what they do at the Game of War, Game Awards is kind of what happens uh, in the rest of the industry. Mm-hmm. Action RPG is kind of like a, a more otaku term so that people like us who really get into games can kind of, it's kind of like with music. Like, a lot of people will say, oh, that's an indie band. But I'm like, no, that's a shoegaze band, or that's a post-punk band. People who are really into stuff try to find more granular designations for things to make it easier for them to talk with other people who are into it as much as they are. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what happens with the, has, what has happened with the action RPG, particularly with sites that have been around a long time, like GameSpot and IGN. When they built those databases, that genre didn't even mm-hmm. exist. I also feel like... Uh the mid 2000s bioware games kind of ruined a lot of it yeah, you know yeah. like yeah. like they blurred so much and like mass effect in particular like changed sort of what you thought of when it came you know cuz it was an action game yeah but the it was first still on, one it was still on, was really weird yeah they could, but it was still an rpg cuz you were building your character and making yep. decisions and you were you were altering the story as you went through you were yeah. playing that role and that yep. role mattered what you wanted it to do yeah um, but you were still it was still a cover shooter you know so so like yeah. kind of action rpg shifted whereas before that i think action rpg if you said action rpg to me i'd probably think like diablo yeah um, you think you no that's what that was originally what yeah. that's where the it came from yeah Diablo is like the first action RPG, basically. But because it was it and like two other franchises, they never got like mm-hmm. their own designation. And you got to the point where, like, what was like, you remember the PlayStation 2 era where you had like, um, what were those? Uh, like the, the, the Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance and yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yep. like Champions of Norath. Yeah, and yeah. So that was sort of like a little, little you know. That was like the gateway kind yeah. of to what we have now. Yeah, because because I rec- as I recall, they, it took a long time for the action RPG to really come into its own on consoles. Yeah, because it was too hard to. I mean, the consoles couldn't handle the power was. Well, there when they for decided, hey, you know what, we're just gonna not even try to do that really far pulled back isometric angle, yeah. and we're gonna make it more like yeah. a typical action adventure. Because we don't have a mouse. Right. That's yeah. when the console gamers started saying, hey, mm-hmm. maybe I do like role playing in my video games. And then we had to start. Right, well, wait a minute. What about Zelda? Yeah, <laughs> and like you know, that yeah, I mean the the bottom line is that all genres are just starting to melt together. We yeah. I think we talk about this again like every year when we do the yeah. Game Awards. They're all every genre now has RPG elements or roguelike elements. I mean, eventually it's just like eventually the population of the Earth is all going to be like a brownish tan. Mm-hmm. Like eventually we're going to have like just video games. Yeah, there's going to be a level up system in Tetris soon. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just kind of the way I it's feel like that. Did that go back to kind of like Call of Duty 4, where suddenly they figured out that using sort of that leveling and sort of XP system was a good way to tie people, like, to their character? To, you know, it, 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 there's a weird investment in something when you oh, see yeah. that, when you when see you that bar it, By hand, absolutely. And so anyway, by my, in my definition, God of War is an action RPG, and my runner-up was Assassin's Creed Odyssey, mm-hmm. so that would be my second pick. Um, absolutely. And I do feel like there's a lot of player agency in how you play God of War. Um, you can just roll with the axe if you want, which is what I ended up doing because that's, I just generally am kind of a melee player. But you could also use bows and all the other weapons mm-hmm. that are in the game and get really good with those. I hardly even use like the Blades of Chaos. Oh, sorry. I just spoiled Now stuff. you blew it. <laughs> well, it was like nine months ago. Bum, bum, ba, dum, wow. Have I, I passed the expiration date on that yet? Yeah, but now, <laughs> now you're in the period of people are about to get it for Christmas. <laughs> I'm sorry. I and apologize. they're going to open that on Christmas morning and be like, shame. I'm really sorry. I apologize, guys. <laughs> I thought maybe I had gotten out of the grace period, but maybe you're right. I, I hadn't. But uh, I just, I freaking love God of War. And so because I do consider it an action RPG, it was the easy winner mm. for me for best RPG. Well, uh, stay tuned. Yep. Got more to go. <laughs> I, I didn't more. leave Kratos out in the cold. Yep. Uh, next up is best indie game. Strange jump there from best RPG to best indie game. Who stacked this show, Kyle? Sam. <laughs> it was Sam's fault. Uh, next up, best indie game. Uh, Matt, what's your pick? This is also a crowded field. Yeah, but, um, lots of good indie games this year. One of my favorite games of the year was Subnautica, uh, which I think came out in like January. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, was it was in early access early. for a long time, but yeah. it was like... It came out 1.0, finally got released in like January, and I think it's just, it's on the consoles now. Yep. 
Um, just I, hit console. And I think we... I am not a huge survival game fan. Um, uh, I think we talked about that about Below last last week where yeah. we didn't, didn't like the survival game elements put in that. But for whatever... I mean, I, but I am a big fan of underwater stuff and looking at fish. And <laughs> this game, like, I... This is the best uh, time I had playing a game, I think, on PC all year. Because um, I played it on PC. And... It's very hard to figure out what you're supposed to do early on. Yeah. Um, it's a like rough it, beginning. Yeah, it's, it throws you into it. But I don't really mind because it's so pretty. And yeah. once you figure out how something works, it's like, oh, okay, that works, the I get it. The pieces start it's to cool. fall it into comes place. place. Yeah. But like eventually, I mean, eventually you're building like submarines. And it's one, insane you, what eventually Eventually you, you build like your own version of the Red October. I mean, it's a full-size like it's giant submarine. It's pretty insane to think that you start in a little like space pod yeah. in the middle of the ocean. Your space pod with a knife. what you can do. And by yeah. the end, you're commanding this like a submarine with a moon pool. It's sending out smaller things. Yeah. And, like you're going down to the bottom of this crazy <laughs> trench. And like, yep. I mean, you're fine. It's, it's fantastic. I, I and, you know, and early on, I mean, you're, you're barely able to hold your breath for like nine meters down and eventually you find like when you first craft that oxygen supply yeah. and you're just like oh you know like you're building bases underwater it's great you know so it's, yeah. it's like um, it's got kind of a no man's sky element to it and it's like you're just yeah. sort of there to explore and, and kind of like you're so, trying to survive but you're also there to explore and, and figure out what's happening on this planet and see all these weird creatures and find your way into these new biomes and uh, I just loved every minute of it. Like it's, uh, you know, I, when I think back on like all the, you know, I did a scrolled through sort of all the indie picks of 2018, and uh, this was the one I had the most fun playing. And uh, you know, I, I, I didn't want to forget it too because it was so early in the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, it's easy. But easy um, to do. also, I did play it early access like a year, year and a half ago, and the final I hadn't played it since then, and the final release was so much better and so much more polished. Yeah, they had, I mean, this amazing. was in early access for a long, really long time. time. Yeah. So when that happens, you kind of expect there to be huge changes, but I think this game even went above and beyond. Yes, yeah. for sure. I would, I would definitely. If if you've got some ready, if you're ready for to be patient. And figure some stuff out on your own, or just look up a walkthrough. I mean, yeah, that's the. <laughs> we don't have that luxury when we play games. Not so. <laughs> usually, no. But the, I mean, the walkthrough thing is also interesting on this because some of the stuff you need to do is so like kind of gated in terms of like, well, you just got to find it. Yeah. You know, like um, that, you're still not, you're, you know, you're still not getting it for free. Basically, I would say. Yeah. You, know, you're, you're, you still got to do the work, even if you know what you're looking for. In stuff these, to, in this still game. time management and yeah, all that kind of stuff comes into play, even if you know what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, and. Uh, I I just love this game to death. Uh, also, you're scanning some stuff. Yep. You can, be, you can <laughs> build a scanner and scan Achilles, fish. That's Matt's yeah. Achilles heel. You put scanning in it. Let me scan. Yeah, I mean, one of these days, it's just, they're going to make just like some kind of weird surveillance game. Scanners. They'll make scanners. Scanners, scanners fish edition. And you'll, <laughs> Where you'll the never, fish heads explode. You'll never see me again. <laughs> uh, my pick for best indie game, and again, I'm going to... I want to discuss a little bit some of the other big oh, indie yeah, games. Oh, yeah, and uh, sorry, good, good point, uh, Vincent. Subnautica's free on the Epic Store right no, that's now. right. So uh, if you want to try it, that's a pretty good way to try it. For PC. For PC, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm going to explain, after I tell you what I'm going to pick for best indie game, I'm going to explain that I went back and played some other stuff. So my pick for the best indie game of 2018 is Donut County. Uh, some of you guys may have not even heard of this game. It is a very simple premise. It is a game where you control a hole. And that's it. You can see in the footage right now, you control a hole and you go around and you basically suck things up into the hole. And it's a puzzle game built around that ability. It's like Katamari backwards. And what I was going to say is it does have a Katamari flavor to it because as you play, the hole gets bigger and you're able to suck in bigger objects. So it does kind of have that Katamari vibe to it. Also, like Katamari, it's just funny. So I laughed my butt off playing this game. The downside of this game is that it's really short. I finished this game in about two and a half hours, something mm. like that. Um, and so that is one thing that's to its detriment. But as I started looking through all the indie games for 2018, it astonished me that I really struggled to find anything innovative. Typically, indie games are incubators. They're where you can try stuff with low risk. You can try out all these crazy ideas and features. And if it doesn't work, so what? You didn't invest $200 million into the game. And if it fails, it's tough for some indie developers. But anymore, a lot of indie developers aren't really all that indie anymore. They have big teams now making these games. So 
I went back and played several of the indie games that have won awards at the Game Awards, for instance. So I went back and played Celeste. Did you play Celeste? Uh, a little bit, yeah. What did you think of Celeste? Didn't really move the needle for me. Like, me I, was, I was impressed by the, you know, there's more story to it. Like, the writing seemed good. But it just seemed like more Super Meat Boy stuff to yeah. me. And I don't really gel with that. It was just mega hard platformer number four, yeah. 14 C. Like, like, I feel like I'd like to watch a video of the cutscenes, but I don't really feel like I want to play any more of it. I mean, I just felt like I was being tortured playing it. And <laughs> I've said this about games like this before. I'm not a big fan of Super Meat Boy. I'm just like, I'm why? Also, I'm also not a huge platformer fan in the in the first place. So, like, that's and not... Again, again, that's not I, there are super hard game, you know, permutations I do enjoy playing, but platforming is not one of them. Yeah. And I've said many times I'm kind of burnt out on the 2D platform because I've been playing it for like 40 freaking years. Um, and so they have to do something really special to kind of catch my eye. And I just didn't feel like Celeste did anything like that. Like, I I don't know. I, yeah, I, I feel like the, the, the praise in that game really seems to be p partly resting on whether you like that type of game or not, but also resting heavily on kind of the narrative and, and the writing. And, which and, is good. Which for is that good. For that genre, it's probably the best. But there's also an element of like, that ain't the game. Yeah, like you that, still have to that's play. That's not what I'm playing. The, you have to play you know? the game. Yeah, and that's where it kind so of. I just sort of bounced off it. I like, did too. Yep, I did not enjoy it that much. So um, I, again, I started looking around at all the indie games. I'm like, what's the most innovative? What was the most fun? And for me, it was Dota County. Like I just had it twisted. I haven't even played it. I get it? Know. Like it twists your brain with the puzzles, but it's also just really, really funny and clever. Um, so what are the puzzles exactly? It's well. You have to figure out what objects you need to take mm. away from the world, essentially. It so to like clear the world, or yeah, I mean yeah. it's basically like a screen by screen puzzle mm. game. Um, it, but again, it is really short. It's not. It doesn't cost that much. I think it was like twelve bucks or something like that when I got it. Uh, so it, even if you feel like it's a risk, it's not that big of a risk. Um, but again, keep in mind it does not last that long. So it's not one of those games you're going to buy on the Humble Bundle sale or a Steam store sale and play it for the next two years, but I probably would recommend buying it when you do find it a little bit cheaper. Uh, but there you go, my end of the game of the year for 2018. Cool. Let's move on to best VR game. Matt, VR should be hitting its stride right now. Mm -hmm. We should be seeing the best VR games for every HMD. All of them have been out in at least two years now. Developers should have the, the dev kits for these things wrapped around their pinky finger at this point. All VR games should be best in class at this point in 2018. Um, do you feel like we're getting there? Well, my VR headsets have been packed in their boxes since I moved a year ago. So no, <laughs> no. I don't really feel like they... I, I haven't either. seen anything that really made me pull them out. I don't, um, I, I don't feel like VR has managed which, to hit that sweet spot right. like most platforms do at that two to three year period. Which is why for this category, I am doing the opposite of what I did for RPG, and I'm just going to pick what you picked. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have the same winner for this category, and that is Astrobot Rescue Mission. I mean, if there was one thing I would drag the, the VR headset out of the closet to play, it would be that. Yeah. Because I loved the little demo, the you know, little short one they did in the Playroom VR. Yep. And this is a full game of that awesomeness. Um, I, I don't think it was even... I didn't really like to think about this category. And I definitely played a lot more VR games than Matt did this year. Not as much as probably more, the... More than zero. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Not as much probably as the upload VR guys. And look, there were periods where my PlayStation VR just sat there doing nothing for two, three months at a time. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say if I had to pick a best HMD for 2018, I would hands down give it to PlayStation VR. Uh, the, quant the quantity and the quality of content on PlayStation VR continues to rise, although not at the rate I had hoped it would. Yeah, I think the quality uh, is undoubtedly like in PlayStation's favor here. Yeah, the, the as far as having like real games to play and yeah. those games feeling polished like any other AAA game or big budget game would, uh, I think PlayStation VR has it by leaps and bounds. And this was undoubtedly PlayStation VR's best game this year. Uh, if I had a an honorable mention, I'd probably give it to something like Moss. Um, there were some other good kind of com competitive mm -hmm. uh, VR games that came out this year. Uh, but I think most polished, most interesting, best use of the medium, absolutely Astrobot Rescue Mission. Uh, let's move on to best action adventure. So this is a category for the last several years. Is we've had games that straddle the line between action adventure and action RPG. 
And tying into what we were saying earlier, Matt, what is your pick for best action adventure? My pick is God of War. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah, you knew this was where that was going to end up if yep. I didn't think it was an RPG. Yep. Um, so pretty much the same reasons. I mean, I, come on. Like, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> we're going to have to talk about this game a, a lot, lot over the next yeah. hour and a half. It's, so. a, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing achievement in terms of like combat design and world design and character writing and narrative. A lot of my, the reasons I'm a big fan of the narrative actually I can't talk about because they come in the last hour of the game. Yeah. Um, but thematically, there's some stuff that happens that drives home uh, both, thema- both thematically and in terms of character, there's some stuff that happens near the end that makes you see a lot of this stuff in very different light, and I think it's brilliant, and we may not fully understand what it implies until we get this, the next game, um, but it's great. And uh, I have I a feeling a lot of people who play this game will never even see it. <laughs> you know, this game actually, had, according to, to Sony, uh, or to, according to Corey Barlog, like, a, a surprisingly high percentage of people have finished it. Wow. It was like 50%. Wow. And like the normal is like 20 to 25. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, I understand why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think the best part of this game, honestly, is its pacing. Yeah, that's true. It never, it, It's much longer than I thought it was going to be when I started it, but it never felt like it was going on never too drags, long at all. Never drags. Um, and it's like a 40-hour game, and it ends like right on time. Yeah, and right when like... Right when they have a little bit of extra thing to throw at you, and you're like, oh, wait, oh, okay, uh, well then, uh-huh. we'll, I'll see you next time, Sony Santa Monica. <laughs> In you know? eight years. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, we're, I think we're getting a sequel to this pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, they have the engine and everything. They've got it down. Know. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the combat. Um, you know, the, uh, the axe is, a, is an achievement, especially for a character that has such, you know, such an iconic weapon oh, yeah. to replace it with something else. And have a, nobody complain. Move. And like, <laughs> yeah, once you get your hands on it and you feel how, how good it feels, yeah, especially swack. the yeah. swack when you hit something in the head with it, when you throw it, and like you pull it back and it just whacks back into his yeah. hand. I mean, they did a whole little it's feature so video on, on why that feels good, like how they took frames out of the animation yeah. to make it feel like it really hits him in the it hand. Snaps, yeah. Um, you know, it's a very cinematic thing. You know, game, I think, you know, I understand when people like say like, oh, I thought the... The fight with Balder at the beginning uh, was boring because, like, it was just like you know two guys knocking each other around and like who cares? And I'm like, yeah, I get How is that. that. Boring. I get that, but it's also <laughs> no, like, it, it wasn't one guy thrown through a tree? Yeah, they're knocking each other through like <laughs> mountains and shit. Yeah. Um, How is that boring? Well, some people don't like that because they don't—they're not in control. It's just a oh. thing that the game is showing them. It's a—it's cin- a cinema. You might as well be watching yeah. a movie. But I don't have a problem with that, especially in a cinematic game like this. And also, I think they set up in the early part of the game. Uh, how powerful Kratos is! Very, you know, very. I mean, he's carrying yeah. trees right around and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then, like the when he when you see this like little dude at the, you know come to the door and he just suddenly knocks Kratos over the the house. Yeah, I was like, you're, oh, you're shit. like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> you know, and, and you know, yeah. it just starts it with you know, it starts it quietly and I the game, and, and then all of a sudden, like great. you're off, like and it never yeah. stops. It's it never stops moving again. Um, it's great. It's, it's fantastic. Great. <laughs> it really it, is. Um, and, and since I had God of War mm-hmm. in RPG, my best action adventure for 2018 is Red Dead Redemption 2. And that would probably be my second pick. Yeah, yeah and it clearly, I mean, that game clearly is not an action RPG. If anything, it's it's like an action sim. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like it's it's got some elements, but it's yeah. like it's not that. It's more of a yeah, it's more of a. Here's the old west is the dirty as cowboy as simulator. A, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> like, literally at times. Yeah. I don't. I I would get so annoyed when his coat would get dirty. I don't know why. Like, <laughs> or the horse would me. get filthy, yeah. and you'd wash it, and like your eyes would pop out at how shiny the horse looked. Um, so yeah, maybe this is more of an action sim, but there's also a ton of adventuring in this game. Yeah. Um, uh, Post launch, now that I finished the game, I'm just kind of poking around. Didn't win best multiplayer, I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> no, it did not win best multiplayer <laughs> game. Uh, but poking around like on YouTube and seeing kind of what people are doing with this game post. The, the big sort of, like, uh, initial impression month, the first month that it's mm-hmm. out, people are just kind of moseying around the environment just looking for stuff and finding some really cool stuff in this game. So there certainly is a heavy adventure element to the game, in addition to a lot of the sim stuff that we were talking about before. Um, but, you know, that's just the beginning of talking about this game. Obviously, some of the best production values ever in a video game. Uh, your mileage will vary with that depending on how tolerant and patient you are um i'm not the most patient person so certain parts of this game that other people may love turn me off 
Mm -hmm. um, but I can appreciate that other people would absolutely love some of that stuff, the realism, kind of the slower pace. Um, I was listening to, I think it was Joe Rogan's podcast, and they had some guy on there who uh, is a hardcore gamer. And a lot of times people will go on Joe Rogan's show and talk about games and try to act like they're hardcore gamers, and they're not. But this guy who went on there was, and he started talking about Red Dead Redemption 2, and he said, this game was custom made for 40-year-old white men. Hmm. And I sat there and I'm like, you're absolutely right. 40-year-old yeah. white dudes love games like this because they love cowboy movies. When we were kids growing up, cowboy movies were the thing my dad... I'm named after a cowboy movie, for God's sake. That's true. I am yeah. literally named after the movie Shane. So um, I think this is one of those games that older players who maybe are a little more patient will enjoy a little bit more. But no matter what, uh, if God of War is out of the equation, it is undoubtedly, to me, the best action adventure of 2018. And both games feature the protagonist saying, boy. Boy. You're right. Because, <laughs> I mean, because uh, Kratos says it all the time for yeah. the kid. Yeah. But when you maximize your bond with a male horse in this game, Arthur, boy. when you get on the wall, go, boy. Boy. Hey, boy. Yeah, and I'm, boy. Just, I'm, I'm just like, yeah, okay. This is just a... <laughs> It's just dad gaming, top to bottom this year. <laughs> it is. One of my other picks for this category would have been the Shadow of the Colossus remake, yeah. uh, which I like a lot, but it's a remake, so I didn't right. really want to. Yeah, I tend to try to favor new original yeah. I mean, games. Shadow of the Colossus is my favorite game of all time, yeah. so like, obviously, but it's just like, I mean, it is a really good remake, it is, but it's yeah. still just a remake. You know. It's the same game, yeah. And credit uh, to them for it being the same game for a ground-up remake, but yeah. I didn't think that counted. Yeah, I always try to reward games that are new, because to me, yeah. you know, that game got kind of got its due back when it yeah. came out. And who would have thought that God of War would be would feel so new? No, I know. <laughs> uh, next up, best strategy game. This category we did not have two years ago, but we did have last year, and is coming back this year. Matt, what's your pick? Um... I found this category a little light on the ground this year. Yeah, but, well, um, I there's all those XCOM clones coming now. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what we got, Mutant, what was that, Mutant? Mutant Year Zero. Year Zero, yeah. yeah. The furries, right. XCOM, yeah. Um, like a weird cross between like furries and Beyond Good and Evil. Yeah, uh, but, we're um, seeing a lot of indie studios start to emulate that XCOM template. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good template. It is, absolutely. Um, but my pick for this uh, ends up being Battletech. Uh, because partly because I'm a BattleTech fan from way way back, um, but also and I think if we talked about it on the show and I'd only played a couple missions and I'd gotten stuck on a bug and had to redo 30 minutes of a mission, I was a little irritated with it at the time. Yeah. But I did go back and play it once they'd sort of like you know they'd done some patching. It'd been a while. I wasn't as mad at it anymore, and I got through most of like, like two thirds of it, I would say. And uh, I really dig it. I I I think you know I, I'm a big fan of giant robots uh, in general. I'm a fan of BattleTech. In particular, I can't wait for the new action-based MechWarrior game that's coming. Um, but I thought this really nailed it. It felt, you know, because it's pretty easy to do like kind of a giant robot strategy game. You know, in the, it is in the XCOM uh, vein, I would yeah. say, using kind of the pseudo real-time motion thing, and like choosing your choosing your target in, in first person here. You can see, and like then it calculates stuff. But um, It'd be really easy to just sort of do a standard sort of giant robots running around in XCOM, you know, X plug giant robots in XCOM and call it a day. But they really model all this, all the systems that make BattleTech BattleTech really well with the, the heat, you know, you know, building heat with weaponry and using yeah. heat as a weapon. And also, you know, do you want to fire all these weapons on this turn because you'll raise your heat up and the heat will go back down the next turn. But if someone else hits you with like a flamer or something, then that's going to overheat you and it's going to ruin your whole strategy. And like, it's just, it's all there. And uh, it never, it never, uh, it never got dull to me. Uh, I think they've done a good job with their their expansion packs that are coming up. They seem to be on board to support it all the way through to the end of next year. Um, and uh, it was just nice to see BattleTech kind of come back in style after f spending so long, either dormant or as sort of a slightly decent online free to play game yeah. for so long. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. All right, my pick for best strategy game of 2018 is Into the Breach. More uh, giant robots. More giant robots. Um, probably the thing that made this game resonate the most with me is that I, it reminds me a lot of Advance Wars, although I like Advance Wars more. And the reason I like Advance Wars more is because it doesn't have that roguelike crap. Right. <laughs> that, to me, was the biggest stumbling block with this game. I hate permadeath. I hate the roguelite stuff. Um... But with this game, I managed to fight through it. Uh, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I, it's definitely one of the more challenging games that I played this year that wasn't an action game. 
Uh, but I also would be, to be perfectly honest, I did not play a ton of strategy games this year. Yeah. So I had like three or four games that I actually played that I could choose from, and this was the one I've had the most fun with. Uh, the other thing I like about it, though, is because it's it has that permadeath element to it, they've really streamlined the game. Um, mm -hmm. Like you were talking about battle tech, you're talking about like you know overheating and all that stuff. That minutia that a lot of people love about strategy, I hate it. Like I prefer <laughs> the more streamlined, simple. Um, being able to know what to expect during a turn so that you can be a little more strategic about mapping out your future turns. Um, and this game is, is great for that. Um, I also just, I like the, the style of the game. I like the music in the game. Um, again, because it gave me that Advanced Wars vibe, which I'm a huge fan of, uh, it was an easy pick for me of the games I've played for best strategy game of 2018. That's kind of a puzzle game at times. Yeah, I mean... But aren't all grid-based strategy games, a bit. kind this, of? This one felt more to me like sometimes we're like, oh, if I can just make the right move, it'll all sort of Fall cascade into place. Into yeah. place yeah. You know? Like dominoes, yeah. yeah. And it does sometimes. Yeah. And, I, and sometimes it just screws you. Yeah, but this game, <laughs> you can tell that the developers who worked on this spent a lot of time thinking about that kind of stuff, yeah. though. Like, if thinking about sort of those cascading actions, and if you do this then that, this domino falls, it knocks into this domino. And uh, that was one of the a feeling that I got while playing this game that I haven't got from playing a strategy game in quite a while. So um, I enjoyed my time with it. It's not one of my favorite games of 2018, mm. but it's my favorite strategy game of 2018. It's mm. an important distinction. Uh, very important, absolutely. Hurry, uh, up, hurry up, 2019, bring me some Fire Emblem. Yeah, it's, it should be coming. Uh, next up is Best Fighting Game. Pretty good year for fighting games. Yeah. Not amazing. Not a ton of releases. Yeah. Fighting games are turning into games as a service. Yeah. So their lives are lasting far longer yeah. than they used to in the past. I, I would actually have thought about Street Fighter V as a candidate for kind of a an ongoing game award until yeah. they did what they did in the last few weeks. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. What, put like, ads in a game yeah, put ads for? in the Put ads during, like, as you load the match. And, like, they added, like, costumes. I didn't even know this until I loaded it up during the Capcom Cup. I didn't know they'd put costumes in where they just slapped Capcom Cup advertising. Like, was it, uh, was it Sterling that put out? That, like, Dol one of Dalsim's places for the ad is on one of his skulls? On, the ne on his necklace? Are you kidding me? He, yeah, he's got the three skulls. Yeah, yeah. One, like the, one, the middle skull has the Capcom Tour logo slapped on the forehead. And I'm like... Really? Like at one at some point, it's like Sprite gonna be yeah, in there. Yeah, like, like Crisco it's, it's, gonna be on. You know, like, <laughs> it, just, it probably will. And you get like fight money for for the in-game currency for using them. Like, yeah. you know, a tiny bit at a time. It's 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 just so tacky. It's bad. It's but um. Bad. But yeah. Um. So on on one hand, it's like yeah, there's some good fighting games came out. On the other hand, um. Fighting games continue to be slightly embarrassing at times. So. Like SNK Heroin's Tag Team Frenzy? Yeah, a Remember bit. when we talked about that on the show? Vaguely? That, that, game, yeah. that game made me sad to be a gamer. <laughs> I was like, I don't want people to associate me with this game, like, ever. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are with fighting games. But there has been a couple good ones. Mm -hmm. So what is your pick for the best fighting game? Uh, my pick is, uh, honestly, I think there's really only one pick this year for that. And it's Dragon Ball Fighters. Fighters. Um, I don't even like Dragon Ball. I'm a, I was a little too old when Dragon Ball yeah, made, made, it, made, made it over here. Yeah. Um, it real Dragon Ball seems to be something you really need to see between the ages of eight and twelve. Um, <laughs> yep. Judging by my <laughs> judging by our friend Corrado, who did see it at that age yeah. when he was growing up in Italy, because they yeah. did air it over there, and yeah. he loves it to this day. Still, and I, yeah. I saw it when I was like twenty one, because we would run it in the the game store I managed at the time. And it, I thought it was the most boring garbage I had ever yeah. seen. Because the owner's grandchildren loved it, and they were eight. Yeah. That's it. And um, but he refused to deal with it, so he'd send him. The, he he owned the the record store it was attached to, so he'd send them back to our <laughs> section, and he's like, "You Your watch it, with, you watch it with him, because I don't want to see that crap." <laughs> and I was like, "Fair enough, you know." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cool. I get it. Um, so I don't even have. I have zero love for Dragon Ball, but this game is amazing. Yeah. Um, it is. More or less a take on the Marvel versus Capcom sort of tag fighter thing. What's well, so, I mean, it's like, Arc System Works. Yeah, it's a Blaze That's Blue guys. their template. It's their th thing. Yeah. But, like, they nailed the property so well. They did. That yeah. it's, I mean, it, it's hard to sometimes see it as a 
polygonal game. Yeah, like they, yeah. They, the, the art style is so good. It is, yeah. And you know, I think you know it's blown up in the tournament scene. It was the number one uh, most sign, watched at Evo, sign, right? Most watched at Evo, and I think the number one sign up for Evo. Yeah. Um, which I don't think anyone thought someone could beat Street Fighter at that. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it, for, for some reason, it's not part of Evo Japan. Um, yeah, it's weird. Which the I, games they chose for Evo Japan are weird. A little though. odd. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if part of that is because sort of the, the new Smash isn't the there. The Marvel Tag Battle uh, style of game has always been more of a U.S. like Western thing. Yeah. Um, that that caught on more in the West than mm-hmm. than in Japan. But um, yeah, I've been you know, watching the tournaments. I haven't played a ton of fighters fighters. <laughs> um, just because I played enough to sort of familiarize myself with it, but I still run into that problem of like I don't know who any of these people are. Like, I don't, yeah, I, I reviewed the game and I I don't know who any of them are either. But like watching the tournaments, like it's you know even if, with no attachment to that, like it's it's a fascinating game to watch and it's entertaining, especially once people sort of branching out outside of the you know everybody picks the same two characters and then one character they like. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, just like sort of how the early teams in these games go. Yeah. Um, but I've enjoyed watching it all year. Um, and uh, I, it's clearly better in almost every respect than I ever would have thought a Dragon Ball fighting game ever would be. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy for the people that do love Dragon Ball that finally got a game that does justice to what they love. Uh, and I, th- I think it's just I think it's the success story of the genre for the year, no question. Yeah, my uh, I have a nephew who loves Dragon Ball, so I could totally relate. And of course, you know he was right in that age group. He started watching; it when he was like eight, ten years old, and he still loves it today. Um, and I, like you, I am not a big Dragon Ball fan, and uh, therefore my pick for best <laughs> therefore my pick for best fighting game of 2018. It may surprise some people is Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. I was not excited for this game, really, at all. Um, I, I just really didn't have a ton of interest in playing it, and then I got it. And I have been consistently playing it ever since. And I'll tell you what really changed my perspective on this game was playing it with other sifters. When we did that stream, and I was playing with three other sifters, hmm. um, that changed my perspective on this game. And once I, I started enjoying playing it, then I started digging in and, and playing all the other modes. And I think, you know, a lot of ways, Smash Brothers Ultimate and Dragon Ball Fighters are kind of similar games because they're really just like reskinned versions of an older game. Um, you know, Arc System. A bit more, more literally in Smash Brothers' case. But is yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 there's a feeling of Marvel to it, but I mean, Arc, Arc System Works came up with their own combo systems, and you know, it, it does. It, it, the the skill of one doesn't necessarily translate to the other. At least it didn't for me. Yeah. Um, whereas Smash Brothers is more or less the same thing. I'll, the, the the main thing that soured me on Smash Brothers is. Uh, some of those later character unlocks are a pain, in, or they were. I think they patched it. So I haven't even got to that yet. But like, I, like the last four guys, like I was, I was ready to kill whoever invented Star Fox. <laughs> it was like, I you're not alone in that though. That's I been couldn't a common, touch him. Common complaint is that the last few characters are yeah. almost impossible to unlock. I'm not even there yet. I, I've still got tons of characters left to unlock. I've just been exploring the astounding breadth of this game. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if I would go as, so far as to say it's like the most robust fighting game ever because I think as long as Netherrealm is in the discussion, mm. that's not going to be an accurate statement. But aside from Netherrealm's games, this game is just monstrous. Like, there is so much to do. And I get that people may not like some of it. Like, I'm not a huge fan of some of the single player content, but if you don't like it, you just do something else. There's just so much on offer. It's the ultimate version of this franchise. Like, I don't know if we'll ever see another one, to be perfectly honest with you. It does feel like this would be a good way to just sort of, like, just don't make another Smash Brothers. Just continually port this one forward and add to it. Yeah, and as you get a 4K console, just up the graphics mm-hmm. to 4K and we'll be good. So, um, I, I had a lot more. I, had, I love Dragon Ball Fighters. I was really high on it earlier in the year, but I've had more fun playing Smash Brothers than I did Fighters. And Smash Brothers, even though you're right, this is like a reskin Smash Brothers, there's still only one Smash Brothers. And we get this game once every seven or eight years. Uh, tag style fighting games, uh, to me, we get them at least one per year every year. Uh, and Arc System Works, I think itself puts out pretty much one fighting game per year with a tag system. I don't think they really do. I they, mean, Blaze Blue, there's what, four of them now? Yeah, but Blaze Blue isn't a tag game. 
It's a, it's a straight 101 fighter. No, they, you're right. They did put out a Blaze, that one tag battle game that was like Blaze Blue and a bunch of other anime shit I've never Cross seen, tag never heard battle, of. right? Yeah. yeah. Like that was a big crossover between a bunch of properties I don't really have much familiarity with other than Blaze Blue. Yeah. Blaze Blue also... And really, Fighters is the reskin of that, of tag battle. A little bit, yeah. Um, uh, but look, you're splitting hairs here. Both of those fighting games are great. I just enjoy my time with Smash Brothers a little bit more, and so it gets my nod. You can't go wrong with either one, though. Yeah. I've also been impressed as we've played more of it uh, since, you know, because I think we'd only, I'd only had a few hours with it when we talked about it before. I'm really impressed by how good Simon is. Yeah. I think Simon, Simon the Belmonts uh, turned out real, real well. I until was, they I'm, nerf him. Yeah. Until they, <laughs> but for now, like, he's, a, he's a great zoning character, and that's my kind of style, so I've been having a, actually a really good time playing Simon. Like, I, I was, I'm, I, they did not half ass for once. In I don't know how long we got a Castlevania thing that was not half-assed. Yeah, because Konami Cause had Konami very little do to it. do with it. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly why. I guarantee it. All right, let's move on to best driving game. Uh, this is another category where Matt and I have chosen the same winner, and I know you guys can guess what it is right now, but we'll tell you anyway. Forza, Forza Horizon, Horizon Four, 4 uh, without a doubt. But here's what I would say. It's the obvious pick. Far and away the best driving game of 2018. Not even close. But I feel like this year the genre was revived a little bit. We got a couple franchises that were not particularly polished, not particularly big, but they had unique concepts that I hope will be things that other developers will look at and either improve upon or emulate going forward. And that game was Onrush, which has a very unique take on online multiplayer racing. And I feel criminally underrated and criminally underpurchased. And the you're, other you're one, a, you're an advocate party of one for that game. I, I haven't I seen anyone else mention that I know, game. But they should not be. even in an awards I category. I mean, just mean like no one noticed. You can probably find it for like twenty or thirty bucks. Sam, did you say you saw it for cheap? It's free. Oh, it's free on Rush. Yeah. Where? PSN. Is it this? Oh, this it's month's? PlayStation Plus this month. Okay. Yeah. So maybe a lot of you guys are experiencing it. I really enjoyed that game. Something different. And then there's Trailblazers, which was another completely flip everything on its head racing game where you actually had a teammate that you raced with as you played. Both of those games were a little rough around the edges. Trailblazers far more than Onrush. But I just wanted to point out that the racing genre, which sometimes we don't even have in these awards. In fact, last year we didn't have it in these awards. Mm -hmm. We have it this year, and for good reason, because there are some developers out there that are really pushing the envelope on the genre and trying to do some stuff that's new. Now, let's talk about Forza Horizon 4 and why it's the best driving game of the year. What, what is it about it that sets it apart for you, Matt? Um, I think it's mainly the scope and yeah. the variety of what you can drive and the way they sort of mix in like some kind of, it's, you know, uh, it's been described as a car PG. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, it, I, the other games also I've lost some interest after I collected all the bonus boards and sort of, you know, did the basic, uh, you know, the showcases and sort of, this, this one kept me playing a lot longer, um, even after I'd gotten the bonus board stuff, even after I'd you know, seen all the seasons, even after I'd been through a few rotations of, of you know, the various showcases and various stunt things. Um, it kept me playing in the sense that I think the, the, like the, the England uh, setting is a lot of fun to drive through, and it kept me playing with the co-op events, and it kept me playing with the sort of the way the seasons change over every however many days, like five days or whatever. Yeah. Um, like, and then it would it would give you a new set of challenges with a bunch of decent rewards. Yeah. Uh, like it, it, they they like I said before about the, you know about the multiplayer, but I think it extends beyond that. They I think they finally nailed their own formula this time. Yep. And it all and just did. it all just sings. It, it this is another game that's very well paced. Yes. If you want to just stay on the main breadcrumb trail, you can, and it's fun and engaging and varied, and you're not spending too much time doing something you don't like. There's always something that you will like right around the corner. Um, and again, like you said, the scope and mm. the scale, uh, the weather. Uh, it is, to me, this is the game that they've been trying to make all along. Yeah. They finally got to the perfect zenith of their tools, their expertise, and the hardware available to make it on. Mm -hmm. And to me, I mean, I try to stay away from hyperbole, but this is probably my favorite driving game of the generation. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, um, also, um, that's a big statement. I would say the best soundtrack since the first one. Yeah, I mean, all their soundtracks are great. They're all right, but this one, I think they, they 
stepped it up a bit on this one. Yeah. There's been, I've, I've liked two and three soundtrack, but I've always had like a, a you know, my favorite was always Horizon One soundtrack, and this one I think might have finally eclipsed that. The irony is that they moved away from the music festival thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and now you feel like it has the best soundtrack that's also, ever. That's also a good point. Like, like moving, they move further away from the ridiculous kind of yeah. bro -y, Dude bro -y The dude crap, bro, yeah. like Burning Man with cars nonsense. Yeah. And it's like, they made it more of like a, like a media event almost. It like, makes more sense. Yeah, it, it feels it feels more like something that could happen. Right. Uh, outside of the whole, the cops have all been removed from, yeah, the, from, from the, the country. Apparently, <laughs> but but uh, a Forza Horizon Four. I don't think either one of us could say enough good things about it. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it yet, go freaking buy it. Ask for it for Christmas. It is a great driving game that will last you for a yeah. really really especially long if time. you have an Xbox One X. Like oh yeah, damn. Get ready to get blo be blown away. Uh, up next is another new category for this year's awards, and something that we finally relented on after... Like a mere mere hours ago. Yeah, I, I've, I've been <laughs> fighting it internally for a couple of weeks, though, in all honesty. And I fought it last year before we did the awards, but finally we are going to give an award for the best game as a service. Uh there's going against the grain, and then there's there's just being stupid. And I, I think if we wouldn't have addressed this category this year, we would just be being stupid. Mm -hmm. So uh, we probably should establish what that means. So it has to be a game that I would say has it been out for at least a year. Mm. Because is a game really a service until it's been out for a year? Yeah, like you got to make sure it goes the distance. I guess. Right. Um, and so that's kind of what I set up as our parameters for this category, Matt. What it has to be something basically continually updated, updated continually gives you new content, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So, Matt, what's your pick for the best game as a service for 2018? Um, well, this might just be me, but I'm picking No Man's Sky. Because these guys, Hello Games, uh, you know, had, had a, a rocky start <laughs> with certain segments we'll of the population. <laughs> um, didn't stop me from playing 150 hours of the damn thing. Yeah. But they have consistently, um, they went, you know, they went dark for a while, and then after that, they have consistently continued to put out, you know, substantial, large updates that change how the game plays, that add tons of ways to, to play with the game, that, you know, revolutionize sort of how basic elements and basic aspects of the game even work um, a couple of times, uh, and it's all free. Yep. And it just it just rolls out and rolls out, and they don't you know they don't waste any time. They put a trailer out; it's out a few days later. Um, they it, and it's they're still doing it; it's still going, and it, it looks like they've kind of found their feet. If they're finally they're publishing that uh, what's that other game that they announced at the Game Awards? This little micro game, that, like two of two of their guys made. Hello Games. Hello Games. Is, I didn't even see that. Yeah, was, we talked about it. Um, it was I can't remember what it's called now, um, but it was it was like one of, it was like one of those little. Indie game where the the little uh, like wizard looking dude gets lost and they have to has to find his way back. He's in the boat and he goes go, he's going down the the river, kind of in a, in a cave. You remember that? At no, all? I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember it at all. It's uh, interesting. They're, they're publishing it by two of their. It's like a micro game by two of their guys. So they're they're sort of brand, finally they're finally putting out their second game. <laughs> um, but well, I, when your first is that ambitious, I'll give yeah. you a pass. But I think even as uh, as someone who always liked this game, it is a completely different game now, yeah. and it's a much much better game. Yep. Uh, they have realized all the things uh, that they either hinted at or misled people over. Uh, you know, in the run up to the release of the game, you can play multiplayer now. You can do almost anything you can think of. The, they've made you know change the biomes. There's a whole underwater thing they've added recently, where like now all of a sudden there's like totally different creatures underwater you build underwater bases instead of glitching underwater bases which didn't work too well all the time um you know it's no subnautica but it's there <laughs> yeah um they've added you know new storylines and uh, it's it it just keeps going and keeps getting bigger and keeps getting better and uh real multiplayer real multiplayer i yeah. mean that's really the big thing for most people because that's what people were disappointed the game didn't have yep and they went above and beyond what they were even promised ultimately so yep. Kudos. So they, uh, yeah, in the end, they made good. Took in fact, them, I, I mean, took them kudos a to that studio in general. Yeah. I mean, it fought through angry internet mobs, which is no easy task to stay on task, motivated. Um, 
the amount of work that they've got done after the reception this game got initially is astounding. Yep, and we're two and a half years out now. Let, and right. still... Lesser people would have folded the tent and gone home after what they went through, but they did not. They stayed and persevered, and the result is an amazing game. Yep. Started as a great game, and now it's an amazing game. Yeah, I think if, uh, if you've avoided this or haven't touched it since, like, August 2016... Uh, you might be You're in for surprised. a big surprise. Absolutely. Uh, okay, my pick for best game as a service. And I have to say, this category, I had to think probably fifth longest of any of the other categories to try to figure out which game. Because part of it, too, is that I have been going back and playing some of these games as a service. Uh, we launched uh, a show called Service Call that's all about that. And while we've only published one episode of that, I've actually done the research for two other episodes so i've kind of gone back and played some of these other games as a service and my winner is fortnite and i think one thing we should keep in mind is it, me giving this category to fortnite isn't because i think fortnite is the best game that's a game as a service the way i looked at this category was what is the game that is that is doing that service the mm. the most justice what is using which, which game, which is, game using, is killing it? Right, killing it in that way. And to me, when I started looking at it, like Fortnite's just destroying everyone. Like the only other game that I saw that kind of came close as far as dedication was Overwatch. But Fortnite, the stuff that they do in Fortnite to keep people hooked into their seasons is amazing. Mm -hmm. They have these strange events that happen. And somebody always manages to catch it on video, and then that video goes on YouTube, and then the whole community starts freaking out. What could it be? Yeah, it's like they, they, they leverage kind of the idea of like an alter, alternate reality game, like an ARG, to, to keep the community interested in talking to each other. And then the crazy part is, they pay it and all then, off. Yeah, and then something actually happens as and, a result. And it's like a thing. So everybody puts their guns down, and they all stand around, completely passive, and watch the next season kick off, essentially without knowing 100% what it's going to be about and what are the details of it. And look, you get all the other stuff you get in every other game as a service, which new weapons and skins and emotes and all that kind of stuff. And they're very good at that as well, I should add. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's how it's the marketing of its new content. And it's not just about, like, internet ads or advertisements on TV. It's in-game marketing. You're exposing little clues to your audience. The, your, your fans are rabid fans, and they're taking those clues, and they're running with them, and there's conspiracy theories flying around, and then ultimately a trailer will come out that'll kind of tease it a little bit, and people are like, oh, we're on the right path. I don't I just, they are just masters of, I don't want to say manipulating their fan base, but they are. I mean, honestly, they're messing with, like, the expectations and the emotions of the players, but in a way that the players don't ultimately feel like they're being manipulated. They're, they're happy about it. They enjoy these wild goose chases, these breadcrumb trails that Epic has put down for them. So I think if I was going to launch a game as a service, I would look at what Epic is doing with Fortnite. And I would, while I maybe not emulate that model 100%, I would certainly at least take it to heart. So mm -hmm. for me, best game as a service in 2018, Fortnite. All right, let's move on. This is an old standby, but the one that always generates the most discussion in the comments after this episode, <laughs> inevitably, other than maybe Game of the Year, and that is Best Platform. So Best Platform, it means the best console or PC or mobile or VR, whatever, just the best platform for 2018, and generally, that means which platform had the best games, and even more importantly, usually, the best exclusive games. And so, Matt, you and I have chose the same winner this year. For once. For once. And the winner for best platform is PlayStation, PlayStation 4. 4. Um, I've chosen PlayStation 4, I think, every year we've done this yeah, award. Yeah, I think that's right. I've gone PC a couple of times. Yeah, but uh, here's the first thing I would say after getting ready for these awards is that 2018 is a joke compared to 2017. Mm -hmm. 2017, I, I, we, we talked about it at the end of last year that we thought it was one of the best years of gaming ever. And I think now that we're done with 2018, it's all the more obvious just how amazing last year was. Because we're no less in the sweet spot of Generation 8 now. We're mm -hmm. still in that same spot, but the games that came out last year compared to the games that came out this year, 
no comparison. Mm-hmm. Last year was far, far better in just about any way you want to chop it up. Certainly in terms of volume. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, the volume of quality releases just mm-hmm. dwarfs this year. And this was a great year as well. Um, but when you start really kind of cutting it to the quick and saying, okay, let's look at each platform individually, again, to me, it was very easy that the PlayStation 4 is the winner. Mm-hmm. God of War, God of War, Spider-Man, there's two exclusives that I, I would say are in the top four or five games of the year for everybody. Mm-hmm. And you have two exclusives that are sitting in there. That, in, in itself, um, puts it over the top for me. I'm sure there's going to be Nintendo fans that are going to say, but look at what the Switch had. It had more. It did have more. I think it had yeah. more exclusive first-party games than PS4. Yeah, it just didn't have as many I cared about. Yeah, it just didn't have as many good ones. Yeah. It may have had more, but I can't think of a single game for Switch that came out this year that's better than Spider-Man or God of War. So, when you, and then you yeah, start to factor in... Very angry Pokemon fan. Out yeah, there I know, somewhere. but it's just the truth. And then you start to factor in you know, the length of those games... Mm-hmm. In addition, um, it, to me, it makes a PlayStation 4 a clear winner. And then you have all the other stuff that's going on behind the scenes with PlayStation with the exclusive DLC deals, with games like Call of Duty. Um, a lot of indies are starting to change. It used to be that all the indies came to PS4 first. That, we saw a shift in focus this year. A lot of games are starting to come out for Switch first. But if they're not coming out for Switch first, they are coming out for PS4 first. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I mean, when you take into consideration PlayStation VR, I mean, without PlayStation 4, there is no PlayStation VR. So, by extension, PlayStation VR is a part of PlayStation 4. Um, and to me, the best HMD on the market this year as mm-hmm. well for VR. So, uh, it's been another great year for Sony, both first party and, you know, they had third party exclusives as well, that, yep. which other platforms don't really get anymore. So, it's. The PlayStation at this point, PlayStation 4, is like a snowball rolling downhill. It's so big that people are going to keep piling on, and the snowball is just going to get bigger and bigger until it gets to the bottom, and eventually mm-hmm. it crashes when they launch a PlayStation 5. Um, I don't know what a platform would have to do at this point uh, to dethrone PlayStation 4, but I think maybe next year we'll get a vague idea of it. At least I think we will. Possibly. If Sony, if Sony decides to come out of its cave. Yeah. Well, so you're saying like PlayStation 5. But I'm saying maybe next year, Switch or Xbox with all the studios that Microsoft has purchased, mm-hmm. maybe well, Microsoft, for the chance. Microsoft has some, weirdly, has some momentum. The, what was the MPD today said that for the first time in either for a long time or forever, uh, all three consoles sold over 1.3 million units in November. And the fact that that's Xbox, great. I mean, Switch and PlayStation, that's not sure, super yeah. shocking. But the fact that Xbox sold that much... That's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. That's a turnaround. I mean, it's not going to let them catch the Switch or the PS4, but like, that's a that, that's a much healthier Xbox than I expected to see this generation. That's a healthy industry. Yeah. I, I, I love seeing that. I, I, w- I would honestly be most happy if all three consoles sold exactly the same. Wouldn't that be great? It would be really hard to argue online. Though. Exactly. That's why. <laughs> That's why it would be so awesome. Nobody can make arguments about this is better or this is worse. Everybody could just enjoy video games for what they are, the best entertainment medium on the planet, instead of being, oh, well, my favorite company doesn't make that, then that's trash. So dumb. Well, interesting to see uh, what Sony has next year. Well, they'll have Ghost of Tsushima, Will Last they? of Us Part Two. Will they? They should. Will they? They they should. They Death should. Stranding. I would certainly like to play Ghost of Tsushima, but will they? I think so. What about the first half? I mean, what are we, all we get the first half of the year is Days Gone. Just gonna, mm-hmm. Yeah, but you, those yeah. other three are pretty big. They are, but it's just weird. It's like we got God of War for the first quarter last yeah. year and uh, this year, and now we're gonna have to play, you know, bikers. Yeah, it's and then like, even, and then for this year, even if you look at like some of the games that you and I personally don't care about, but a lot of people do, like Detroit. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people really like that game. I didn't care for it. You didn't care for it, but a lot of people did, and it sold really well. And I think a lot of people look at games like that as like that's like their filler game in between big AAA, but yet it's still really high quality and a little bit different and unique. Um, yeah, I, I think mm-hmm. PS4 clear winner this year. Yeah. I just I feel like uh, I feel like everything's a question mark next year in terms of that. It's exciting. Yeah, could go out, could go anywhere. It's good to not know what's going to happen. I think. I think uh, I, I I will not rule out giving it to Switch next year if Metroid Prime Four yeah, A sure. comes out and B doesn't piss me off. Yeah, yeah. But like, 
Yeah, it's going to be a it, it, next year. Seems like the first time in a long time that this category would is going to end up being a because you're going to have the legit new Pokemon RPG on mm -hmm. Switch next year. And, uh, presumably, Microsoft will release something. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> once they get cracked, maybe Crackdown Three is the thing that's clogging all the works up. And once Crackdown Three comes out, <laughs> it'll the just Dan's be a, a, fl break. a flood of amazing <laughs> titles. That'll be a. If that's the case, Crackdown 3 better be damn yeah. good. That's all I got to say. Gears Funko Pop is just going to sweep. <laughs> uh, Gears 5 should be here next year. Yeah, yeah. Should um, be a big Gears year next year. Yeah. Year, 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 year. <laughs> next up, best story. Um, on Sifted, I have story ratings set pretty much at the bottom. Uh, so you guys know that I am not a big... Mm -hmm. uh, proponent of story in games are act it's not Mine's that i'm not like a proponent I, yeah i know <laughs> we're that why we're different that's why the show's good though is because we have different tastes in games um so yours nine mine's like a one or a two mm -hmm. so story isn't the most important thing for me in video games gameplay generally is but it is important in general uh, matt what is your pick for the best story of 2018 my pick for best story is god of war um, that's a good pick again in part for reasons i can't discuss on the show because yeah. it's end game spoilers right um, but I really liked what they did with Kratos as a character. Uh, I was impressed they did not make the child annoying. Um, I liked all the various characters. Uh, right when you're kind of getting a little accustomed to the uh, Kratos-Atreus relationship, um, they bring in uh, a disembodied head that cracks wise constantly in a Scottish <laughs> accent, and that's great. That's always, yeah. you know, more disembodied... I had completely forgotten about that More character. severed Scottish heads, please, in video <laughs> games. Um... You know, all the characters are, are fairly memorable, I think, for the most part. Like you, you, uh, you know, they keep they kept the cast pretty small. Yeah. For the most part, I think that was a good a good call. Uh, I think they can expand it out larger next time. But like they really focused the story on these these two characters and their relationship, and that worked very well. Um, and I think the incorporation of uh, Norse mythology uh, was a big success. And yep. uh, the revelations at the end of the game put a lot of those those ideas of character and setting uh, they throw them into a different a different light and uh it proved to me that they really had thought through what they were doing and why they were doing it and why they were doing what they were doing with kratos in particular um like the the point of kratos's motivation and story and goals in this story and what is what, and what you learn at the end of the story kind of throws a lot of that in, in a different a different light and in a way that I don't think Kratos realizes, which makes it kind of tragic. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, and something it doesn't really get a lot of credit for because nobody wants to talk about the ending. Because everybody wants everyone to see the ending on their right. own. Yeah. Which you should. Yeah. Um, but uh, I thought as a complete narrative like package, no other game did it as well as uh, God of War did this year. Now you guys know how I feel about God of War story. Obviously with some of the stuff I've had in my uh, personal life over the last year and a half, two years. Boy. Defi exactly. <laughs> Definitely resonated with me on probably a different level than for a lot of other people, but it did not win story of the year for me. My pick for the best story of 2018 is Red Dead Redemption 2. And uh, for Red Dead to beat God of War, knowing my personal situation and how I could potentially relate to the story of God of War... That, that should show you how strongly I feel about the story in Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, I remember when they first started showing some screenshots and showed the first trailer for this, and they showed the whole gang, and I was like, damn, that gang is, like, gigantic. And I wondered, like you were talking about with God of War, how they kept the, the cast small, and mm -hmm. it, you managed to know everybody and relate to everybody and kind of understand where everyone was coming from and how they relate to everybody else in the story. And that, to me, is what's most impressive about Red Dead Redemption 2, is that this gang is gigantic. And yet I managed to get to know every single one of them, I felt, on a pretty intimate level, to where I knew what their motivations were. I, at least I thought I knew whether I could trust them or not. Um, I thought I knew whether they were out for themselves or out for the gang. Um, I, I learned the ones that were really stupid and you couldn't trust to send out on certain missions. Um, that's tough to do, to introduce mm. that many characters and, and create an entertainment product where the, the person who experiences it feels like they know each and every one of them intimately. That's no small feat. And then you start talking about 
the overarching plot, which to me is very interesting. Um, probably a little cliche for yeah, westerns. That's where it, see, I, you said. I mean, about, on the run from the law. Yeah, I mean, you said about God of War earlier that like you know it just it's paced perfectly throughout. Yeah, that's where Red Dead Redemption Two loses me. No, you're right. Is the middle is a big you're saggy right. thing where you just. Kind of, Yes, I know we need one more big job, Dutch, but I have $20,000 in my pocket if you would like to just go now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, how much do we need? Because I'm rolling in it. You have any, any idea how many cougars I've killed? Yeah. Like, it's like... <laughs> You're right. And, and that is kind of a problem with games that are really long like yeah. that. It's hard to sustain the plausibility yeah. of them. Well, especially because Rockstar in general just sort of makes a decision like, our story and our mission design is going to be this... And no matter what you do otherwise, we're just going to ignore Pretty that much element. reality. Which, yeah. like, on one hand, it's like, yeah, that's the simplest way to solve that problem. On the other hand, you're a rock star, and you should probably come up with a new idea sometime. No, you're right. You're absolutely but, uh, right. So I think, I think uh, Red, Red Dead might actually have the best writing of the I, I think that without a doubt. Um, I mean, just like moment-to-moment -moment character work, I think, yep. is exceptional in this game. Like you said... I have an opinion and a relationship with every character in that camp. And um, there's a lot I can, of characters. I can remember in that camp. particular personality quirks of individual like sheriffs in the different towns. You yep. know, like they, they make all the people in the game really memorable, and that's very guys, hard to do. Yeah, think just even think about the guys who work the counter at the train stations. Yeah. Like everyone or like, you run into in this game, you remember them. Or like we're like there's one general store I don't like to go in because I think the guy who works there is a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> and he always yeah, says exactly. something weird or creepy to yeah. Arthur. So you're like, I just won't go in I'm there. Like, no, I'm just I'll just buy it over here. It's yeah. just like <laughs> yeah. um, but I think like narratively in terms of like kind of the overarching thing, it it it, it sags in the sense It absolutely that, like, does in the middle. Without it, I would Maybe there's no way that. around that because of the story they're trying to tell, but like or the length of the game that yeah. they made. I don't know if it's possible to sustain a story well, for a hundred hours. Because the other standard solution is to basically railroad you into doing a certain number of missions before you're right. let loose on the world again, and that's really annoying. Yep. So in the end I'd prefer you let the story sag a bit in the name of letting me play how I want to play. Yeah. Um, and and while the story overall was kind of cliche for Westerns it still was good and interesting. Yeah, like, and also I, like part of I think the, the the second half of the story kind of requires you to set those clichés in motion to begin with because you have to sort of you have to sort of pay them off in in what happens later on. So and I, I, think, I I understand what they're after there. And part of that middle drag, which I agree a thousand percent is absolutely there, I think that actually sets the player up a little bit for what's to come later on because... It does lull you a little bit, yeah. But I think it's a reflection of the lead character in the game. Yeah. Because it, that's what, to me, it's like, that's what it's going to take for him to get to the place mm -hmm. he eventually gets to. It's hard to talk about this without spoiling anything. Right. But I felt like he needed that just getting beat over the head over and over with the same crap before he finally wakes up and is like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Yeah, I think there's an interesting element, because you know, I know I see a lot of people complain about like, you know, Arthur should should have realized X, Y, and Z earlier Way than early. he did. And like... But as, that's the whole story. Like, well, yeah, but he's also... He's brainwashed. Like, but he's also like the... He's completely delusional. Well, eh, he's also just not willing to believe certain things. Yeah. And like... That's delu That's it, what delusion is. But like, yeah, but like he's he's. It's not delusion so much. He's convinced himself something's not true. It's more that like he won't allow himself to admit that he was wrong about something. And it sounds very familiar to a, the real world in yeah, 2018. <laughs> but there's sort of an element of like, um, and I do think it has somewhat of a of a lull that could have been you know handled in pacing a little better. But there is also an element where people are saying like. Oh, Arthur didn't realize X, Y, and Z, and I didn't like that because he should have realized X, Y, and Z. Well, a character making a mistake doesn't equate to bad writing. Like if it's true that's to that, called humanity. If it's true to that character, <laughs> well, yeah, but there's you'll see. I mean, that's what that Cinema Sins channel is all about. Is like they they make they call out sins where like a character makes a mistake because they didn't think perfectly logically and they hadn't read the script. Yeah, you know, and like. I think I think they earn in the sense that like I find do find it annoying that we're hearing the same dialogue over and over again because of you know the way the game is written and one more big score on when we're, I know what we're doing Arthur da, da 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 da. At the same time, I don't find it out of character for Arthur to not allow himself to recognize those things until he's forced to. Yeah, like that is that it's not bad writing. That's good writing. 
Yep. You know, like you, you, you make this, this event true to the character and maybe, yeah, a smarter person would have realized that sooner or a person who saw things more clearly, but that's not that's Arthur. That's not him. He's not no. smart. He, no. he's, had, he's had to be a criminal to survive. And like, he would be the first one smart. to admit that. <laughs> exactly. And that's the other thing. He's self-aware. That's the other thing I love about yeah. the story in this. He is completely aware of himself and yeah. how he's being manipulated by these other four. And he, he has that internal struggle inside himself of like, I know this is a bad idea. I know this is dumb, but this is what I know. And I don't know no better. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I don't know. I, I really love the story in this game. And you're right. It does, it does burn real slow in the middle, but I think at least a little bit of that downtime mm -hmm. was needed to kind of set up what ultimately happens. In and the it is act. also true to its source material. If you go yeah. back and watch something like once upon a time in the West, yeah, it's, it's not a rollicking thrill ride. No. Um, so I, you know what they're, you know, what they're going for is what they got, but I just I feel like the the tightness of, of God of War put it a, put it a, a smidge and above. Uh, although I, I if you were if you were say, saying like best dialogue writing, I would probably give that to Red Dead, yeah. no question. Uh, you can't go wrong with either one of those picks. No, we were right, Matt. In a real <laughs> in a real strong story year too. It is like yeah. Spider Man was in there it, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely in my consideration for this award, one hundred percent. All right, let's move on next to Future Legend. So people sometimes get confused by this category. This is not like the game that we think... A lot of people confuse this with Game of the Year for whatever reason. Mm. But really what we're saying is what game from this year is still going to be played and talked about many years from now. A lot of times the best game of a year of a, a given year isn't something people are going to be playing five, six yeah. years later. Sometimes they're just single player focused or whatever. There's a, millions of reasons why they wouldn't be. But this is the game that we think 10, 15, 20 years from now, people are still going to be talking about. So Matt, what's your choice? Um, well, the real choice is probably Fortnite, but that didn't come out this year. Yeah. Um, so my pick is Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah. Um, I think 10 years down the line, people are still going to refer to this game. They're still going to talk about uh, the characters in it. They're still going to talk about you know, the various game systems and stuff. I think at the very least, uh, when they talk about Grand Theft Auto 6 back when it comes in, they're going to say, like, yeah, but that comes, you know, that was a that refinement was of Red something Dead that was too. in Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah. I think they're going to also talk about Red Dead Redemption 2 because 10 years from now is about when Red Dead Redemption 3 is going to come out. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think this game has made a big impression on kind of the psyches of people, of just about anybody who plays games, uh, whether you love it or hate it. And I think people will will reminisce about it and speculate about it and replay it and argue about it for years and years and years to come. It, it is uh, a rock star game. And, you know, especially with all the think pieces that went up about, like, oh, do we need movies anymore? It's just like, <laughs> yeah, we yeah, do. we do. Yeah. Um, but good clickbait. Yeah. Uh, but, like, stuff like, you know, that kind of thing where, like, it got yeah. people that normally wouldn't pay attention to video games on the level of presentation and artwork. Well, it's and, like I was saying, they're right, talking yeah. about it on Joe Rogan's podcast. Right. Like, you know, and Rockstar games do have a tendency to do that. But, yeah. hey, we're still talking about Grand Theft Auto V, too. Yeah, So absolutely. I feel pretty confident that Red Dead Redemption... Will uh, will have some legs in the uh, the pop culture mind frame. It will stand the test of time. It ain't gonna be Avatar. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, my pick for future legend is Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, and the big reason I, I I agree with everything Matt said about Red Dead Redemption Two. However, I do think that hindsight will not be as very kind to Red Dead Two. Oh, I agree with that. I think, I, think that, I think it's one of the reasons we are reasons we're going to continue to be arguing about it years. Uh, you're now. probably right. You're probably right. But I think a lot of people will forget about it after a while because I think a lot of people will one will never finish the game, and I think two a lot of people will start the game based upon a recommendation mm -hmm. of a friend or the Metacritic scores or whatever, and get you know 10, 15 hours into it and be like, I, I get it. Like that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Arthur. <laughs> yeah. um, Boy. And so. But you're right. Like, <laughs> if I had a runner-up, it would be Red line. Dead. But I chose Super Smash Brothers Ultimate because, I mean, it's right in the title. It's the ultimate Smash Brothers game. And well, it also ties into, like, what we've talked about, where, like, they'll just continue to use this as the platform exactly. for Smash Brothers. Like, I, I think this is pretty much the last Smash Brothers game. They may make a 4K version of this game eventually. Yeah, but Ultimate it's... 4K, Ultimate Next. Right, right. Ultimate, yeah. But this is going to be... I think you're never going to see another Smash Brothers game where... They, 
take some characters out, they take some stages out. Yeah. It's just, this is the new Smash Brothers, but it's not what it was. I think you are locked into every Smash Brothers from now on is all of this plus. Yep, absolutely. And so it's a platform now, mm -hmm. and I think not only are people going to be talking about it, they're still going to be playing Literally this be 10 playing years from now. That's what it'll be. Yeah. yeah, so to me, I think Future Legend, I think this is going to be at Evo for the next however many years, and um, it's just going to be a thing for the next decade or more. So... Mm -hmm. That's why it's my pick as Future Legend from 2018. Next up, here's a fun one. Most pleasant surprise. And this could be anything. This could be a new story. It could be a game. Mm -hmm. It could be an announcement. Anything. Matt, what, what's your pick for the most pleasant surprise from 2018? My most pleasant surprise for 2018 was Starlink Battle for Atlas. We have been advocates of that game here on the um, show. You know, I, I, we knew it was going you know, to they, they first talked about this like a couple of years ago yeah and it sort of disappeared and then it resurfaced uh at e3 yep and uh, i got my hands on it briefly and i re actually really liked how it played and uh i'm a sucker for the toys to life thing anyway i believe you've convinced some people to buy this game yeah. plus the uh the star fox integration which was uh, a nice uh, another pleasant surprise during the pleasant surprise yeah which i think we even said like oh this is like star fox without star fox and they're like oh and, and one more better thing than star fox. Like, <laughs> what the hell um and then you know i played it i thought it was you know it's uh, repetitive, but a lot of fun, and uh, it's kind of what I, exactly what I wanted out of it. Uh, the Star Fox bonus stuff makes it even better, and uh, the fact that you can get a digital version of it that has uh, you know all the DLC, all, you know all the Toys to Life content digitally without spending four hundred dollars on the toys, awesome. Um, I think they did that up right, and uh, I I enjoyed it top to bottom. And uh, yeah, I mean these, this is kind of a uh, this you know the space shooter. Uh, genre is something I miss from the old 90s days, the old TIE Fighter X-Wing Wing yeah. Commander era. Um, and this scratched that itch real well, uh, you know, by being sort of that arcade Star Fox idea. And not, you know, it, you can go play Elite Dangerous if you want something more simmy. Yep. But, um, no thanks. <laughs> but this really, re really did a good job. Um, it had a nice little kind of sem semi dynamic solar system thing going on, or like the. You know, you'd have the enemies taking over the planets if you ignore them too long. You have to yep. go back and clear stuff and fight the boss battle again. Um, I dug it. And uh, I think... Uh, I liked the tone of the game, too. Yeah. It was nice yeah. to play a game that wasn't so deathly serious for once. Like, Yeah, it, it kind of played like a, like a Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, it had like levity that. to it. Like a kind of, I wouldn't say tongue-in-cheek, but yeah, I mean, it, it's... It also was a little Nintendo-ish in that I could see where kids would get completely sucked into the world, mm -hmm. but also adults our age can play it and enjoy it. Um, obviously, the Switch version is a preferred version with the Star Fox stuff in it. Uh, and the other part of this, too, is that you can buy this game now for 40 bucks yeah. with, with like the ship and like everything. Like The starter pack is mm -hmm. now $40. It was started at like 75 and you can get it for 40 bucks now. So yeah, they've been putting this on some deep discount. Yep. Also and, on uh, digitally as well. There were some good deals over Black Friday, and I bet they'll come back for Christmas. Yep. So if you have had your eye on this game, uh, you can get it now for cheap. And I have a feeling if you wait till after Christmas, you could probably get it even cheaper. Probably. So it might be one to keep an eye on for uh, when you're ready to spend those gift cards that you are inevitably going to be given. Yeah, the digital deluxe version that gives you like all the the toys digitally is like it's like eighty bucks. Yeah. You know that's like the price of like three and a quarter ships yeah in real life you know the, the toys yeah uh that is definitely the best deal and uh you know you don't you don't really miss the ships when you're just switching around digitally it's much faster yeah yeah it's, i don't know i would never use the actual toys to i did I, enjoy, I enjoyed it i would most. do it at first as like a novelty but eventually if you just have the stuff in there there's no reason to keep yeah eventually because like when you put the toys on you unlock them digitally for like a week yeah and i, I did find myself eventually just switching switching through yeah. the menus it's 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 way, it's way easier. easier kids i could understand would want to do it the other way um and then my pick for most pleasant surprise is a very similar game to Starlink, and that is No Man's Sky Next. Um, I was completely taken off guard by these No Man's Sky updates. Matt's already talked about them extensively earlier, talking about the changes that have come to this game. Um, Matt was a lot higher on No Man's Sky when it came out than I was. I think that's pretty well documented by <laughs> the spirit of discussion that we had over the game when it came out. Um, and I'll tell you, if this were the game that we got back then, Matt and I would have had a very different conversation back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I honestly, after everything that happened with this game, 
uh, my expectations were so low, not just for updates, but for anything. And I wouldn't have blamed them if they had just been like, you know what? Screw it. We made our money. Yeah. Cut your losses. We turn a profit on, on this. Move on to the next thing. Let's move on. To our... No, they didn't, though. Nope. They stuck with it and turned it into not only the game that I thought it was going to be all along, but something far better and greater. Um, and to me, that is a huge surprise and a pleasant surprise because I wanted this game to be great all along. So... Um, it's it's a shame it didn't come out in this state. Uh, I feel like it would have, you know, if you start talking about the future legends, uh, this game might have had a chance to be one of those yeah. if it had come out in this state at launch. I don't know. I feel like 10 years from now, people are still going to, you're still going to mention No Man's Sky and people are going to be like, lying jerks. Right. I hate them. You know, like, right. Oh, no. like people yeah. are still going to be mad about it for industry. Is that a reasons. future legend or is that something else? I think I think uh, people will still tell legends of Sean Murray, the lying monster who deceived children all around the world. Yep, you're probably right. And didn't let them play multiplayer in their space game. Yep. Uh, but again, like, look, if you had No Man's Sky when it came out and you kind of fell off or didn't finish it, go back. All the updates are free. Download them. Take our word for it. I think you'll be glad that you did. Next up, another fun one. In mm. fact, we're getting kind of into the fun categories now. <laughs> For, I mean, it's been a slog and terrible things. Up well, no, now, we, it's just all been genres is what yeah. I'm saying. Now we're getting into like some of the more like odd categories. Next up, most disappointing game. No explanation needed right. for this one. So um, I think there's an obvious choice here, but I, I counted on you to make that one. And I picked... Uh, the crew too. Yeah, which is a good pick. <laughs> um, which I uh, I was looking forward to because uh, I did moderately enjoy the crew one, but that demo they put out um, just killed any inkling of buying this game for me. It I don't was... think it was just for you, Matt. No, it doesn't seem like it, especially since I think it's seventy percent off right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I please... think that demo was one of the biggest mistakes Ubisoft ever made. Yeah, if that demo hadn't come out, I probably would have bought it sight unseen. <laughs> you know, they, they'd have my sixty bucks, and that would be the end of it. But, yeah. When, uh, so when, when someone yeah. asks us in a Q and A later on, when they'll be like, "Hey, like, when was one time where putting a demo out was a bad thing?" Yeah. Now we will this have one. this to point to for for those answers. Uh, like I, that was one of the few times I remember one because I was playing it when we were setting up for the show, and like periodically, like even Sam would come in the room and be like, "Ugh, like, yeah. what, what? Why? Why do you have to?" You know, do this? when Sam yeah. notices something, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, he's just building cities. Yeah, <laughs> on his phone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree with you. The crew too, huge disappointment. I mean, I drafted it in my fantasy league, so obviously, yeah, I there thought it was going to be a lot better than it ultimately ended up being. I mean, it, it ultimately is worse than the first one? Yeah, somehow. <laughs> How is that possible? I it think took part them forever it, to get the first one to a good place. Well, I think part of it is because they, they spread themselves too thin. It's like, okay, now you're going to what? Add, you're going to add boats, and you're going to add motorcycles, yeah. you're going to add planes. Like, you barely got cars. Like, like cars in the first game, when, they, when the game launched, the cars drove like bricks of they margarine. Did. They were yeah. just nothing. They were... Didn't feel like cars. They didn't feel like anything. And they're gonna triple down, Matt, yeah. for the sequel. <laughs> idea. I love the idea of the crew. I love like the kind of this like you know like you know I don't know kind of like shorthand map of the U.S. and yeah. like you can go all the major places. It's like cruising and, USA, and, yeah. In but 2018. like, just, but you know, and I also just just make a good racing game. You know, just start with the fundamentals. Yeah, well, get the if, fundamentals right. Then start putting the icing on the cake. Yeah, look at like forts. Look at for, like forts horizon. Is basically the same idea on a you know slightly smaller scale, but it's like, and the, you know, and look this, there we are, Matt. Yeah, there we are. And, and this is also good. Yeah, you know, the crew two is also a good example of the opposite of what I'm talking about, where you're talking about like involving multiplayer in a in a smooth and There's like engaging apartment. way, like. <laughs> This, the multiplayer in this game is weird and choppy and, like, it doesn't integrate into the game well. And you're, like, everything's competing on the leaderboards. Or maybe you're, like, you have to line up with these guys over here. Oh, now this guy's, like, in your game for no good reason. Like, he's yeah. just sort of trying to ram you while you're, like, trying to do something else. But you can't yeah. because you're all, in, you know, you're intangible. But it's, like, he, you can see he's trying to be a jerk. He just can't. Um, <laughs> it's, like... It's just that, you know, I, I love the idea of kind of jumping all over this, the country and doing this thing, but it's like, it just doesn't feel good to play, for lack of a better description, and like, none of the things they want you to do are particularly interesting. Yep. Agreed. Uh, my pick for most disappointing game, the one that Matt alluded to earlier, the low-hanging mm -hmm. fruit, the easiest choice, Fallout 76. Yeah. 
I still haven't played this, so that's the other reason I didn't play right. it. Well, I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. It was funny, too. So we've fallen behind putting up Game Face on YouTube. My apologies, people on YouTube, if you get to see this. Um, we've fallen behind. So one of the last episodes that we posted, I was trying to catch up last week, and I started posting old episodes to get up to speed. The last one was the episode where I said that I did not think Fallout 76 was that bad. <laughs> and so everybody watching it, they're not checking when the show was originally recorded. They just think I'm insane. Mm. They're just like, oh my god, you think Fall 76 is good? Like, you're crazy, you're an idiot. And I'm like, I know, I need to get those other episodes out where I apologize. <laughs> you a date stamp. And I say I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, just put it like right on there. But they don't get it. So, um, to be fair, I thought you were crazy when you said it. Yeah, but I'd only played like three or four hours of mm-hmm. it. And honestly, the first three or four hours of this isn't bad. It's when the longer you play, mm-hmm. The more glaring, ob- glaringly obvious it becomes that it's a piece like of a, crap. Like a dawning horror yes, kind of thing. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I, I regret saying that I enjoyed the beta, even though I did really enjoy the beta because I only played it for a few hours. Um, but once I dove into it more than that, that's when the, the crack started to show. Um, and because I was at one point really excited for this game, and it is Fallout, and I love the Fallout franchise, and I love Bethesda's games, and it. I mean, who would have, could have seen this coming from Bethesda? Let's just be honest. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, the thing is, like, it's Bethesda's games, you know, the in-house stuff, not the, not the stuff they publish, like id and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do tend to have a pretty bug-ridden sort of, like, you no, know. No, they're always buggy. Situation. But, but the bugs aren't the problem But there's with usually this. something that you can look past sort of that because, like, you know, the, the gameplay and, and what they have you doing and kind of the world they're immersing you in is so good, you, you sort of, like, deal with it. But none of that's here. Yeah. Like, it's not the bugs that make this terrible. Doesn't help. It's the lack of anything interesting to do. <coughs> right. I didn't have a ton of bugs in, in this, to be perfectly honest with you. It's just the game itself just isn't fun or interesting or varied enough or a million other. We're, we're talking about someone who like comes from this area. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the fact that it was uh, set in West Virginia ultimately mm-hmm. did little to nothing. I mean, I can even I can overlook some stuff to see something set in the the Bay Area. You know, I, yeah. I even played a fair amount of Watch Dogs too. Yeah. Which, which uh, that's some love for the for the for the San Francisco Bay right there. Yep, absolutely. To suffer through that game <laughs> for any longer. I mean, better than Watch Dogs One, but still. Yeah. You can only do so many drone races. I think also in hindsight, I'm a little salty. I feel like. You know, Bethesda took advantage of its fan base a little bit with this game, I think. Um, and that's something that Bethesda typically never does. It's usually very mm. respectful of its fans and its audience. But I, I almost feel like Bethesda was kind of backed into a corner where they were like, man, we don't have a big game for like the next, like, you know, they were looking a like year and a half years. ago. Yeah. And they're like, wait, like, we need something in here. And they're like, okay, well, what Range about this? Range wasn't going to make it. Right. So. Um but that doesn't let them off the hook no. for this game at all. I mean, I'm sure they... I mean, nobody sets out to make a bad game. Right. Other than the guys who, like, sued Jim Sterling or whatever. Right, But, right. like... <laughs> but, you know, it's just... It, it's clearly not done baking. It's, uh, you know, not to not to go full Great British Bake Off on you, but it's, just, <laughs> it's underbaked, mate. Yeah. It's underproved. And I don't even know if there's any way to save it, though. Like, you know, it is underbaked, but what do you do? What do you do know. now? I mean, part of me wants to say that, like, look, if No Man's Sky can come back... Yeah, that's a good know, point. You never know. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done here, but I don't think it's impossible. The question becomes, does Bethesda think it's worth right. doing that Is work? it worth it to do it Or is point? it better to just, you know, cut your law? I mean, on the other hand, what else is this team doing? Because you know, this is the Austin guys. <laughs> I don't this, is know, the, yeah. this is the former Battle Cry right, team. Yeah. Um, They're not finishing Battle Cry, that's for sure. Apparently not. <laughs> um, but it's just sort of like, it feels like that thing, it's like that kind of, it, it has an element of like, to me, it has an element of like day late and a dollar short that Battle Cry also had, where like there had to be kind of a moment where like once Battle Cry, you know, you're working on Battle Cry and then Overwatch comes out. And you're like, oh my god, can we compete with that? Right. And then Battle, and, you know, and Battleborn is also out and is just like going down in flames. And you're like, so this is the fate of someone that tries to compete with Overwatch, even if you're not directly trying to compete with Overwatch, yeah, yeah, which Battleborn wasn't. Yeah. But the pe- people got it in their heads that they those two were kind of equivalents. And Battlecry was much more along the character shooter, you know, yep. realm. And it, was there a moment where there's like, well, 
we just got to cut our losses and de- but I feel like this is like almost the same thing in terms of like a fallout take on like survival games or you know the kind of uh, stuff like uh, you know day Z or whatever but it's not up to par either you know it's 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 you got to wonder like you know what's happening over there and what are they you know what what are they not given enough time is the you know is the, I hope this isn't a precursor of what's to come you know I mean like you mean like Starfield or whatever or just Bethesda's games in general. Well, I mean, this is not Bethesda. This is, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure Their Bethesda, name's on it. Their name is on it, but this is not the same team that's going to make Starfield and Elder They Scrolls. were okay putting a game of this quality on the market. Well, that doesn't mean they're going to make the same same mistakes on their own, you know, internal Bethesda, you know, Bethesda Maryland team as opposed to the Austin team. Um, but, uh... I don't know. <laughs> it's not a good harbinger of things to come, in my opinion. Well, well, I mean, Starfield's interesting in the sense that it's going to be, a, you know, a new property from them in the first for the first time in How Fallout long? Three. No, wait, a new property? New property. Dishonored, I think, was their last new property. That's not right? that's not this team though. I'm talking oh, about, I'm you talking mean about from the, that team. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm oh, talking okay. about the guys who make Elder Scrolls and and uh, now Fallout. Uh, not this fall. I thought you were getting at like, well, how will Bethesda launch a new IP? It hasn't done it for. No, a long I mean time. like the the guys who are you know the, the team that is famous for Skyrim and and Fallout. Like, what was the last the last original IP they did was Fallout Three. I mean, it's not original IP because they bought the IP, but it's the first new thing they made that wasn't Elder Scrolls. Yeah. Um. So that was ten years ago. Yeah. So we're, you know, Starfield's going to be their first new IP or new offering that doesn't have a precedent from them. In, in like 13 yeah, years. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. So you got to wonder what kind of new ideas they have. What are they going to... Why well, they should have plenty. You would think. <laughs> it's been so damn long. They should have more than they can shake a stick at. So, But I think the big, the big problem here is like, you're, you know, Fallout 4 did not have tremendously good shooting and yeah. gunplay. And the compelling, the, the compelling <laughs> part is always the world and the characters and the stories that you, you find and are told in that world. And they basically took those out. Yeah. In favor of having every having a radio drama. And then you see what's left. Right. <laughs> Not much. Not much at all. Uh, up next, biggest news story. Mm. This is always a fun category. It's, this is always one of the harder ones to pick, too. One, because it's hard to go back and dig up all the big mm. news stories. It's hard to find yeah. them. And sometimes the big news stories turn out to not really be that big. Yeah, they think in it hindsight. seems like they're yeah. big at first, but then nine months later with the hindsight, it's like, yeah. oh, that really wasn't that big of a deal. But I think we picked a couple of good ones that are going to continue to pay off I, as we go forward. I believe so. What's your choice? Uh, my choice is Sony pulling out of E3 2019. Yep. Um Ripples. Yeah, because, you know, we've been, you know, we and every other gaming podcast in existence routinely talks about, like, is E3 dying? Yeah, yeah. Is E3 relevant anymore to the game industry? Yeah. And it's like, mm, for a long time, my answer would be like, eh, it's well, fine. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's there, right? It's <laughs> yeah. happening. Now it's sort of like, well, talk to me in July, yeah. I guess. You know, like, I don't know. I got, I, I'm very, very interested to see what Sony's absence what the ripple effect is on, on that, what it makes other publishers think about, especially in light of Microsoft, you know, minimizing their participation in terms of, and also EA and Activision already having pulled out um, at this point. Because uh, how does Nintendo look at this now? Is it like, right. is it going to say, hey, we have the whole show to ourselves? Or, or gonna is be, it going to be like, hey, what are we're we the doing only here? ones left yeah. here. Don't be the last one out of the party, right, Nintendo. Right, exactly. You know, like, yeah. It's and then a, if all the big three are gone, then what happens with the third party guys? Then you've just got E for all, and we know yeah, how that ends. Yeah, pretty ended. much. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a huge story. One of the big three completely pulling out mm-hmm. of E3. Gigantic story that will have repercussions. We'll be talking about this in 10 years. Remember when Sony left E3? Yeah. I mean, depending on what happens after this, if they never come back or if they do come back and... Yeah, here's, here's maybe the attendance drops by like half this year. Like, who knows? Here's a question. Do if I don't know if we know this or not. You know, obviously, Sony's not going to have a presence at this. They're not going to do a press conference. They're not going to have a booth. Da, da, da. Do you think Sony's people are going to go and do the usual meetings? No. You know, behind the closed doors uh, meetings I mean, some, in terms like yeah, you know, I mean, look, with it, retailers and like yeah, you know, yeah, promotional yeah. stuff? I think they'll that. be there. I think, you know, what E3 is for. Right. I, I think they will do that. And I think that people like Scott Rohde will be there talking to developers, trying to sign games exclusively mm. to the platform. 
I think all that behind the scenes stuff that most of the people who are watching this never see will absolutely happen. It has to happen. Mm -hmm. You have to make business deals. Yeah, because that's, that's the core of E3. Yeah. And like, I think, you know, the people don't realize that. Right. They but, see the but, glamour and the glitz and the... But moving forward, could we see, as a result of this, the glamour and the glitz contract to the point oh, yeah. that it's just sort of a cursory you know, nod in that direction and the, and the show absolutely. becomes like any other industry expo, basically. I mean, it becomes second fiddle to something like PAX at that point. Yeah. Probably. So, or even the Game Awards. Yeah, I mean, this has this could have huge repercussions on down the road. Uh, definitely a great pick for biggest news story, without a doubt. Um, my choice is a little different, but I don't think any less impactful. Uh, my choice for biggest news story is Epic launches a competitor to Steam. And a lot like Sony leaving E3, this is something that we don't have to wonder if it will have repercussions. It already had repercussions in less than a week. Mm. already so epic undercuts steam by only charging a 12 percent revenue split or cut three days later discord's like we'll take eight <laughs> percent so how low does it go now it, it's going to change everything and look i've seen a lot of val fanboys coming out of the woodwork the last week and a half trying to make up excuses for steam and for valve uh, some people weren't happy that, you know, I laid into Valve saying that they were gouging us. They absolutely were gouging us for the last however long. You can try to sugarcoat it however you want. They have been charging way more money than they needed to charge for this service all along. Now that someone comes in and sets the market at reality, now we're starting to see what the real prices of this stuff is and what the real cost of running a business like this is. So... You know, it's not just the fact that, hey, now there's this Epic Store, and that's a big deal, and they have some exclusive games that aren't going to be on Steam. It's the competition side of it and how it ultimately is going to cut digital services and the rates that they charge the creators down to the bone. And it's starting at games. It's going to go into movies and TV shows and music and everything else that you download digitally. There, there is no longer an excuse for a service provider to take 30% cut. There is none. There's no valid reason for that to happen going forward. And it's going to be interesting to see how all these other services, not just in gaming, but in entertainment in general, start adjusting and changing. And how long is it until someone does the same thing in the music space? Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know what? Instead of taking 30 cents for every song like iTunes does, we'll take a nickel. How long is that? It's not going to be that long. And they're going to be inspired by Epic. This is going to be something that's going to be pointed to in so many meetings, in so many pitch meetings for companies trying to get funding. So say tomorrow you and I are like, let's be that music company that only charges a nickel per song. There are people doing that all over the world right now. And they're talking about Epic's game store when they try to make their point, when they try to get that money from investors, when they try to convince their uncle to give them 20 grand to give to somebody to build their idea, this is what's gonna be pointed to. So it's not just the repercussions in the games industry, which are huge, but it's this is going to stretch outside of games and affect entertainment as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I think we did a good job picking those. I think those <laughs> ultimately were the two stories that are gonna have the biggest ripple effects throughout the industry and beyond, honestly. Next up, worst game. It's not actually the worst game, though, and we say this every year. There are far worse games out there than the games mm -hmm. that Matt and I are about to talk about. We're saying the worst games that we personally played. And yes, we are very fortunate. We can pick and choose what we want to play. Uh, generally, we choose to play the really good stuff or at least the big budget stuff. Um, so we don't play a ton of bad games anymore, but we did play two. And what's your pick, Matt? Uh, my pick is Detroit Become Human. I hate this game a lot. <laughs> um, just it's the most insipid, idiotic story I was told all year in, it, all, in any medium, frankly. <laughs> Um, I don't think it earns any of its like civil rights thematic ideas because you can't you can't, I think I've said it before, you can't unmoor the idea of racist chattel slavery that lasted 400 years from the civil rights experience and just turn it into androids because you don't, it doesn't match. It doesn't work. There's no, 
equivalent. You can't make you can't make it as on the nose as this game makes it. There is a parallel to be made there, but the fact that they're like throwing Martin Luther King quotes at me and like doing like these direct parallels is at best ham-handed and at worst Offensive. you know, offensively <laughs> in, 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 insulting. Yeah. I mean, I was gonna say insulting. Yeah. Um, I think the tech is amazing. Like it's be- it's a beautiful game, like, yeah. uh, especially on a PS4 Pro. It is one of the best looking games out there. In fact, it would probably be my second or third choice for best graphics. That's um, a big statement. Uh, well, maybe third. I don't know. It didn't make. It didn't get my runner up for best graphics. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it is really, really good looking. Um, I and I've said it before. I wish someone would take this level of tech and this level of budget away from David Cage and give it to someone who can actually tell a story that that is worthy of this level of presentation because uh, I'm kind of out of I'm kind of out of patience with it. I I'll put it to you this way. I played his last two games. I didn't play this one. Yeah, it's that's, I played that's the demo, one. but when the full game came out, I never played it. Cuz I was like, "You know what? I gave you a second chance with Beyond mm-hmm. after Heavy Rain and I'm not Giving him a third chance. On the, strength, on the strength of the kind of the detective bit of the demo, I was willing to give him a strike three, and he did not hit the, the, the pitch. <laughs> You're out! Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, fooled me once, fooled me twice, fooled me three times. I don't know, I was, I was an idiot the last two times, I guess, for believing that. I think, I don't, I, I think this is probably the best well, of the Well, no, you enjoy three. narrative-driven games. Yeah. You want the games to be good. There's nothing wrong with that. Right, but I should know better than to spend sixty dollars on something David yeah. Cage made. Well, you I won't should, do that again. I mean, if oh, okay, look, you love I, narrative games, so it took you three. Right. I don't love narrative games. It took me two. That makes perfect I sense. I probably wouldn't have gotten it at launch if we weren't going to discuss it on right. the show. Yeah. If it was just me, I would have. I would have waited until I could get it for like nineteen bucks, like now or yeah. whatever. Um, and I still wouldn't have liked it, but at least I would have only spent <laughs> a third of the money on it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just think uh, it's probably his, the closest he's gotten to a good game, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. You think it's better um, than Beyond? A little bit. I think I think it has a strength in that the in that the the branching stuff is more thought out in terms of how it's integrated into how you play and go back and replay the game. It's easier to do that. Um, Beyond was a little more. But here's a perfect example in. why I hate his games. Yeah, you got to clean. You it's to always going to be cleaning. You have to go up and down, up and down with the analog ABC, stick. ABC, always be cleaning with the, with the analog <laughs> stick. So you're going to do a lot of household chores in these games. Yeah. Um, but I, one of the things that I was annoyed by with Beyond Two Souls was the uh, the out-of-sequence storytelling, yeah. which, as far as I could determine after two playthroughs, does nothing to drive home any element of the narrative or the themes. It's just out of order because other. I guess they thought that was more interesting. It's that thing where, like... A lot of games do that thing where, like, they want to open with a big bang, so they start with, like, one of the big action scenes. Yeah. And then, like, you have to play the next two-thirds of the game to catch up to that. But, like, the problem is that's a stupid device if there's no reason for me to know that that happened before I go through the rest of the story. Right. It's like in Uncharted 2 where you start in that wrecked train and he's injured and you're like, what's going on? Where is he? How did he get here? And, like... That you, the fact that you know that's coming, and the fact that you're waiting for him to get on that train, and you're sort of like, you, you and once you see that scene again, you know all this other information, and you understand like, what uh, happened. Just, yeah, connected the dots. Like yeah. that's a good example of how to use that. Right, right. But Beyond just does that, and if you play Beyond in like chronological order, it makes way more sense. <laughs> so it's like you didn't do it, but this game They're just, just goes, trying to overcomplicate. This game it. just goes straight through it, tells a straight story from three different perspectives, and that is at least a step forward in the sense that you didn't needlessly complicate it for the sake of making it look like you're super deep, man. Um, but yeah, this game blows. <laughs> <laughs> My pick for the worst game that I played this year is Fallout 76. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst game I played this year. And I am spoiled. I get to play all the best games. It's not like when I was at GT and I had to make sure that like everyone was getting I get to play all the good ones now, which is nice. Mm. I feel like a lot of people are not going to disagree with you. Yeah, I don't think so either. I really don't have to make a point. I don't really have to back up mm. my point here. Uh, Fallout 76 is a bad game. I don't have to play a lot of bad games anymore. Therefore, it's the worst game I played in 2018. Let's move on. It did sneak up on you, to be fair. <laughs> it did. I tried to give it a chance. I tried. I mean, it's not like the crew, too, where, like, 10 minutes into the demo, I was like, oh. You know? Like, yeah. Like, you, you came out of that demo with very positive impressions. I mean, I was 
a little taken aback, but like yeah. you even said it, you should spend sixty bucks on it. I did. I mean, yeah. that is a good first impression. That it was a good first impression, and then literally, like when I started playing it again, like an hour after where I stopped from the beta, I was like, <laughs> oh god, no, this is all there is. Yeah, I uh, again, I apologize for initially recommending. At least you couldn't buy it then. That's the good. Yeah, you could have yeah. pre-ordered it, but you could have canceled it. I'm glad that by the time you're actually able to buy it, I had come to my senses and played more of it and realized it was so terrible. So, yeah. Worst game I played this year, hands down, Fallout 76. Next up is a category that also confuses people because people think this category is games that we hated, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's a game we didn't get. So generally, it's a game that is viewed favorably by most that we did not seem to like as much as other people. It's not that we hate it, it's that we just don't like it as much as everybody else. Mm. Um, so we could still actually really like these games, but maybe they're a phenomenon and we're like, I don't really get why they're this big thing. Matt, what is your pick? Uh, mine is uh, Monster Hunter World. Uh, and this is sort of this, my series for this because- <laughs> You don't I, get it. I don't get it. I have, you know, I see Monster Hunter and I see the phenomenon around Monster Hunter and everything about Monster Hunter should appeal to me and I just don't like playing them. Yeah, you know what? This, it does boggle my mind that you don't like Monster Hunter. It, there is because pretty, every it seems to be pretty much everything it. else about it would yep. be something that you'd like. It is, absolutely. And I don't under, fully understand why. I, just, I don't like the way it feels. I don't like the way it plays. I don't like the pacing of it. I don't like how, like, the, how the whole thing unfolds. I think that like it's ju it just leaves me ice cold. No, I agree with you. I do not like the combat. Mm -hmm. I don't like this. I don't feel like the swords, even though the swords are like 20 feet long and probably weigh half a ton, I don't feel like there's any weight to the weapons in this game. I don't feel the weight of the weapons when yeah, I play you it. feel the slowness of them, right. but I don't, I don't feel a lot of weight to them. Um, and a and lot I've of that's just audio design, to yeah, be honest. True. I played a lot of different character classes. I've played, tried different weapons and like, you know, every, from, you know, ranged and you know, bruisers and fast, you know, agile care. And like, I just don't like any of it. It's, and I want to, like, I, you know, I see all these videos of these crazy monsters people are fighting in the cool armor they're wearing. I'm like, oh, that would be great. That's awesome. But like, I just don't like it. Like, you want to know what surprised me the most about the fact that you don't like Monster Hunter is that you like Fantasy Star Online. That's, yeah, that's actually the kind of the pedigree of this that I'm like, why, if I like Fantasy Star Online, why don't I like this? Yeah, it's like, weird. It's, it's so similar in terms of just basic concept. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, execution. Yeah. But for whatever, it just, I've tried the original. I tried Monster Hunter Try on the Wii. Uh, that's I've, the one I got really hooked on. That's the one I played the longest because I, I was playing with a group online, but I never liked it. I just kept playing because everyone else wanted to play. And if I didn't play, they would have a harder time playing. Um, but after like the third time we fought the underwater guy, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, one thing I would say is that like once you get that far into one Monster Hunter game, your draw to go back and do it again is to me is really low. Mm -hmm. Like I played Monster Hunter Try. I literally bought like a keyboard that would work with my Wii just to mm. play it. Like I was all in. I bought the Pro Controller just to play it, and I got into it. I played Try. I, bought, like, I got like the headset adapter that, thing, right? Yeah. So. I played that heck out of Try. I played a ton of it, but by the time I got done and wrapped it up, I had no interest in playing the franchise anymore. And it could be the case with this game too. There are millions of people who just played this for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they may find themselves in that same boat two years from now when the next Monster Hunter comes out where they're like, you know what? I'm good. Especially yeah. now that it's a game as a service. This is going to go on for the next two years. So we'll see if people burn out on it the way that we have. But, uh, and I would probably. Say but it has been like a kind of a mini phenomenon this year, yeah, Monster for Hunter sure. World. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying it's bad. I just. I just doesn't doesn't click with me in a way that I don't get. I mean, don't get is really the right term for this game for me. Is like, like I look at this, I'm like, there is no reason I shouldn't like this, but yeah. I don't. It just doesn't click with you. I wish it was more like Dragon's Dogma, frankly. Yeah. Like I, I wish it had a little more speed, a little more uh, verticality to the fighting in places, a little less like you know just hammering away at, at damage sponges until they fall over. Uh, which, you know, a little more dynamism to it, I guess. But like, I just don't. Have, I don't have the patience. I don't care about you know, kind of hacking my way through the various systems. 
And uh, I was also a little, I, I, I find the, the premise a little odd in terms of how it's presented in this, where they're talking, it's like, we've finally made it to this amazing new world with incredible new creatures. Go kill them all and take their teeth. Yeah. 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 Like, that's not what's, and they, it's constant talk yeah, about, like, that, research that, and science, and I'm like, yeah. that's not what research and science is. That's trophy hunting, okay? Yeah. Well, this, it does come from the country that kills whales. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but at least and, they, and thinks there's no problem with it when the rest of the world is, is deplored by it. But so. at least they eat them. Right. This they is actually just like, use it. Yeah. It's like the at best you're making a coat, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, and really it was yeah. like early on when I when I ran into this thing where like you were it's just like some one of the dinosaur things or whatever I was supposed to hunt and I I hit him a few times and I didn't kill him and he sort of like limped away and ran so I had to chase him down. Well, he like cried and limped like away from me until yeah, I finally. Like, it makes you feel I'm guilty. like, this is not, I, this is not really <laughs> doing it for me, folks. This is. Yeah. yeah I don't. I don't have the. Uh, the it does make you feel bad when you see them like limping yeah. away. <laughs> I mean, I feel bad when I. Poke. And then you're like running after him with the sword, like I'm gonna finish you off. I feel bad when certain Pokemon faint, let alone like. Well, they're not you know, like bad guys. No, they're like, just the, creatures. They're just creatures that are just living in their habitat. You just roll up and start murdering them. But we have to cut their heads off so we can learn about them. That's <laughs> yeah. not not a single scientist in this game seems to just observe shit. They all just want to yeah. like dig into the corpses. It's very yeah. weird. It is weird. All right, my pick for a game I didn't get, and I think I'm not alone on this one. My pick is Fortnite Battle Royale. Um, well documented. I am not a big Battle Royale guy. I, I think never... you might be alone on this one, judging by the numbers. <laughs> well, but... I, I don't think so. I think the people that watch Sifted and most of the people that are going to watch this on YouTube don't play Fortnite. Fortnite is like the casual player's like jamboree. Everybody I know that's only kind of into games plays Fortnite. People who I know that are really into games never play Fortnite. Um, and maybe that's why I don't get it either. Um, there are so many other first-person shooters on the market that are better. Um, but I guess really maybe what I am getting that I, I'm thinking I'm not getting is that it's free. Mm. I just wonder if that's really the most of it, of what's made it a hit. Can't hurt. Yeah, I mean, it definitely doesn't hurt. But... It's just it's just odd to me that there have been so many great shooters throughout the years, and this is the one that has just become a sensation. Well, I think it's free. It's the new hotness in terms of game mode, and by the time other competitors that maybe are more polished and but are charging money, like like Blackout, um, people are invested. You know, that's the thing is that you know, I mean, you didn't give it best game as a service for nothing. Like yeah. they know how to keep you keep well, people they know how to interested, keep people involved, games, yeah. and hooked, and I mean they're. They're real good at that. I, want, I, I think there's probably a couple psychologists on staff in there, or at least consulting. Yeah, I mean, the other part of it, too, is that a large segment of its audience is really young. That's, really yeah. young. So I just, we have like a test, text message thread with all my friends from Philly that we just jump on and talk about whatever. And uh, one of my friends jumped on and was like, hey, what's up with this Fortnite? Like, my son it, came home from school and said people were making fun of him because he, he, he isn't good at Fortnite. And I'm like, what a what a different world. It is a different world. <laughs> you used to be made fun of for playing video yep. games. Now you're made fun of because you're not good enough at them. Yep. And this has created a cottage industry of people who teach kids how to play Fortnite. And my buddy's like, is it worth it? I'm like, bro, don't you dare pay somebody to teach your son <laughs> how to play Fortnite. Don't, and if you do, don't you dare tell me about it, man. Like, what are you even thinking? But there are... Hundreds of thousands of parents around the country right now that are in that position. My kid is getting ostracized at school because either he doesn't play or he's not good enough. And that's what I don't get. That's, mm -hmm. That, to me, is something I cannot... Uh, and maybe yeah. part of it is the way we grew up. Like, where if you were a gamer, you were a nerd. You're an outcast. I mean, that's been a lot... For a long time now, it's been if you... you know, even, There were even studies, like, in the mid-2000s, mid-aughts. I don't know. But we decided what to call that aughts, decade yeah. yet. yeah. Um, that basically said, like, you know, in a modern kids, if you aren't letting your kids play video games, at least to some degree, they are going more likely to end up being socially outcast because yeah. it's such a standard part of playing. It's happening with uh, Fortnite. Uh, yeah, and um, the thing about Fortnite, I, it's it's the the pervasiveness in the culture is astounding. Um, in part because kids love it so much, so the parents have to be aware of it, which yeah. is part of it. But I mean, I was at a bewitched convention in August <laughs> for various reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but I was probably the youngest person there, but everyone There's a surprise. Yeah. But everyone there was like usually, you know, in their 60s or whatever, 
every single one of them knew what Fortnite yeah, was. Yeah, because they're probably a because grandma. The grandparents, they or they have kids. Yeah. Like there were people with kids there that like. Oh, yep. And the, and the thing was like you know they, like one there was one woman who's she's an author. She's about our age, but she had her like thirteen year old kid there. I think he was about that that old. And you know she was she was uh, an author and she was selling books. So she had a little table there, and he was you know the kid was just sitting there playing his his uh, phone or whatever. And we talked we talked for a little while because she knew my dad. And uh, she mentioned, mentioned, you know, games and what I do and da, 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 And I mentioned, you know, mentioned, oh, she, like, Fortnite. And the kid totally changed. Like, he, you know, he was a sullen kind of teenager just <laughs> playing his phone, doing his own. Fortnite? And, like, suddenly, like, we had, like, a 10-minute conversation about Fortnite. It was a completely different yeah. world. You and can I'm relate like, all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah, and it was like, and you could tell, like, this is what this kid enjoyed and That's what he loved thing. talking about. Yeah. Like, he, his personality and, and facial makeup completely changed like all like of a somebody sudden somebody else here knows what Fortnite yeah. is <laughs> and like that was like the moment like that's I'm, my jam i was like oh i think i think this thing's really big yeah, yeah. and that was after i mean I mean, the e3 party was sign number one obviously yeah. and the, i mean even this week what was the the thing was was jimmy kimmel his thing this week was he cha- his, his youtube challenge was parents uh go into your kids room while they're playing Fortnite and turn the tv off yeah ran, see what happens and like some of it's funny, but some some of it the kids are like attacking the parents. Yeah, yeah. And like, of course, you, you see that posted on gaming sites, and like, turns out gamers don't have a lot of sense of humor about doing that. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, they deserve to get hit in the phone. You know, the kids like knocking phones out of parents' hands for like they're taping them. And then, well, they, you know, what else do you expect when you turn someone's game off? It's just like, uh, bro, not that. Not that, because that would have resulted in me getting my throat torn out. Oh yeah. So, you, you don't, it, but kids don't get their asses beat anymore. Uh, my favorite, not the way it my is. favorite was the one kid. I used to get beat with a wooden spoon and a fly swatter. <laughs> my favorite was the one kid who the dad turns it off and he goes, "Why? What? Yeah. What? What are you doing?" Like he's, he's like he just he, he just can't like, even compute. No, he, he just starts laughing because yeah. he does, he's like, "What? what why? Yeah. Why would you do that for? <laughs> no, why?" And like it was it's just completely bewildered. But it's like. That's how, you know, you, you don't get to be on, you know, a, a late night talk show as, as sort of the... Pre- and it wasn't like turn your kid's TV off when he's playing a video game. It was when he's playing Fortnite. Right. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. That was the, yeah, the key. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a crazy world we live in. I mean, I get why it's popular, but I also... It's not a game I'm going to play regularly. You know, I, I, it's one of Me those, either. It's one of those things I understand from a distance, much like Minecraft. Yep. All right, it's time to move into the big awards. We only have one, two, three, four left. So we've already went through 19. We're doing pretty good. Um, And these last four categories have runners-up in addition to the winners. So this is where we go Mm. all in. And the first category with runners-up is best graphics. Matt, what is your honorary mention for best graphics? That would be God of War. That would be me, too. (laughs) So we both agree, God of War... The second best graphics of 2018. Number two. Put that on your box. Yeah. <laughs> second best graphics of 2018. <laughs> we almost did it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we've talked so much about this game already. Do we need? Uh, have we not talked about the visuals yet? We really haven't. I haven't. Yeah, a I guess. whole lot. I mean, yeah. I think this. You know, the scale of it is very impressive. You got the giant world serpent and. You know, there's, there's not. not as, it's not as like overwrought with that stuff as no, the prior games. No, not as many though. boss battles as I might have liked, but the ones that are there are insane graphical tour de forces, and like I believe the one dragon fight like took them like over a year to just make that. And, yeah. Like, it was. Uh, you know, I understand why there's not so many boss battles in this game because it, they, you know, at this level of fidelity, that stuff just is incredibly work intensive. Yeah. Um, I expect there'll be more in the, in the second one. But uh, just the fidelity on this, and you know, on the Pro, but also on the on the regular PS4, like it's pretty much unmatched. Yeah, this is base like, PS4 footage you're looking at right like, here. By the way, it's just astounding. It what really they pulled is. Off here. Yeah, and part you know they're using a lot of tricks, a lot of clever stuff. You know, limiting the size of the or the, the you know the, the view distance of in each of the areas, and like you yeah, know, it's not an open world walls. game. There is loading no. and but like. Just the size of the characters and the you know the animation of everything and the and the the way every everything moves and feels like it has weight and power and and substance in the world like it just the it category does also isn't stop. like best graphics in an open world game right. it's best graphics period so and this like you know 
is an early, you know, it's an early release in the year, but I remember just playing this and thinking, like, why do we need new game consoles? Yeah, seriously. Damn. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There are so yeah. many, and a lot of the most memorable visual moments from that game, it wasn't about, like, a big creature or some scene where something mm -hmm. crazy happens. It was literally just about, like, the art, the lighting, the mm -hmm. fog, like I think even that very beginning when you hit start and he picks the he cuts the tree down and just lifts it onto his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. And like just the way they sell in the such, in of such it, a belief in, in such a belief of realistically, you know, realized graphic style. Yeah. And they just sell these crazy inhuman mythological superhuman moments in a way that you don't even think twice about. You yeah, just believe it. They just look believable. Absolutely. Yeah. Our winner for the mm -hmm. best graphics of 2018. And we both have the same winner here. Again. So we had the same runner up and the same winner. The winner is Red, Red Dead, Dead Redemption, Redemption 2. 2. Yeah. Like that's not, it's not this even This is an question. easy category. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, this just like the, the fact that they took the time to create visuals around so many irrelevant parts of the game. Mm -hmm. Just right here, the skinning of the animals. like. There's some animals that you just like grab their tail and just like rip their skin off it's like a yeah. jerk. Like yeah, it's a couple of, you know, the smaller like badger sized animals. It's just like Arthur turns into a magician. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, like, actually, you can really skin yeah. animals that way. It's not that easy, but you can. Not, probably not with your bare hands ripping into their asshole. I would think. No, no, no that's no. what he does. He you sticks have to start his, with like yeah, a you need a knife yeah. somewhere in yeah. there. I would think. Um, <laughs> Because he, he literally, it's what he picks the thing up, sticks I mean, his hand, and he's like, Poof. but this is the per but just look at what we're talking about right now. Yep. I mean, that just shows you like the level of detail that they've gone through with this game. Like the animation, I wonder how much animation data is in this game. Like it has got to be like Gigs. double anything else and that's, that's ever like come before. And that's just like text, you know, that's right. like, that shouldn't take up any space at all, but it's just endless. It's just. I think, and also I think, uh, you know, you, you mentioned God of War with the open world uh, uh, caveat. I don't know if I've ever seen an open world game hide its pop in and uh, uh, level of detail draw in better than than this game. Yeah, like, th this yeah, because I noticed that a lot. Like you know, like, and especially when you're dealing with higher resolutions, like with the PS4 Pro yeah. or the Xbox One X, you'll see where you see the LOD a where lot the LOD, more. LOD changes. Yeah. Um, it's one of the 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 only real graphical flaws of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, I would yeah. say. Um, it's uh, most recently, I would say, uh, but it's like, look in at Just this. Cause 4, it's horrendous. But this, it just, I can't remember seeing it, except like maybe certain times when I was like riding the horse really, really fast yeah. downhill and maybe like a bush faded in. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. like, it's like, it's so minor. But it's even like when the bullets are hitting like the rock, look at the rocks flying. Yeah. Like just, it's, if you, you can look at every scene in this game and find something in that scene that you're like, damn. Mm -hmm. Just everywhere. It the the attention to detail in this game is second to none ever. I mean, it really. I mean, of course they had eight years to make it or whatever, and maybe you can call that cheating. But that's that's this award isn't like the best graphics for a game that took two years or less to make. Like this is the best graphics, and this is probably the best looking game I've ever seen, PC yeah. included. And I can't even imagine what the PC version is eventually going to look like. Yep. Just think about that. Holy crap. Uh, this was easy, man. I mean, the only, to me, the only eyesore in this game are the character models. And, and part mm. of that is Rockstar's art style. They have a weird art style for human characters. Um, but they just can't, the hair. The hair just looks bad. Mm -hmm. But I think part of it is that the rest of the game looks so amazing that the hair just stands out like a sore thumb in a lot yeah. of ways. And I think, you know, playing something that really does drop the graphical ball in places recently, which I was just cause four. Yeah. You know, yeah, the, the Arthur's hair is not fantastic, but then you see Rico Rodriguez's yeah. hair. And you're like, oh, yeah, that could have been. It's just a worse. plastic yeah. helmet. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, so there you go. Best graphics of 2018, Red Dead Redemption 2, no contest. Next up, most innovative, and again we have a runner-up for this category. This one was a little tough this year, I think. I didn't, wasn't it wasn't a really innovative no, year for games because, like, in years past, we had like hardware innovation with like PlayStation mm. VR and things like that. But this year, we're pretty. You much... would have thought that there'd be a couple VR games that kind of push that innovation envelope, but there wasn't really anything. Uh, the year. best VR game this year was a, a VR game that just emulated a classic yeah. platformer. So. I mean, it's, it appears that some of the best VR experiences are experiences we've already had before. Just, <laughs> Just with a new pers perspective. Perspective matters, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it does matter. 
Uh, okay, so what is your run up, runner up for most innovative? Uh, my runner up is Yoku's Island Express. We've talked about um, that on the show. Yeah, we've talked about it. It's basically it's a Metroidvania meets pinball, yep. and um, you play a little bug who has a little like a ball attached to. It. I guess uncomfortably dung beetle esque, actually. I would say, <laughs> but basically he's got a pinball with him, and he gets a job. Uh, his new job is on this island, and he takes over as the basically the mail carrier, and you have to deliver letters to everybody on the island. And there's a whole bunch of, you have to meet these people and get this upgrade. And so there's all these different upgrades and abilities he, he gets over the course of the game, like a Metroid game. And every time you get one, you can get into a new area easier. But the trick is that all the traversal is done like a pinball machine. So you, it's all, and it's all kind of like done up like organically, like the, you know, it's all convenient little flippers in caves and, and you know, like little branches of trees flipping things up and stuff. But like you're, every little area has like a little pinball challenge to complete, and then you get the things, open the door, go to the next area. Yeah. So it's like this weird mix of two things I like a lot, and they actually did it really well. Yeah, it's a really and good game. It's like nothing else I've ever played. I definitely recommend picking up that game. Like if you can find it on a sale mm -hmm. here in the next month or two, it's really really good. It's definitely the thing that would always pop to mind when I think about what's the most innovative or weirdest thing I've played this year. Yep. And yeah, it's. it's other years, maybe it wouldn't make the cut, but this year uh, is one at, of the though. few things that showed me something new. Yep. Uh, my runner-up for most innovative is, and this might be a surprise to some people, Sea of Thieves. And much like you, Matt, like, first of all, I was like, oh, wait, I need to pick two for this for this year. <laughs> I was like, maybe we should just eliminate, like, the runner-up. Um, and so I started, like, going through my mind, and I'm like, what were, like, the more unique experiences that I had in 2018? And I'll be perfectly honest with you. Sea of Thieves is probably the most unique experience. Whether you like it or not, or you are entertained by it or not, I can't say I've ever played another game like it. It's different. Where every person, everyone's per, every person's real, and every person has a role to play that's specific to that person, and it's not a redundant role. Everyone's doing something different and having to work in concert to work against other teams. I've just never really played a game like that before. Do I feel like Rare dropped the ball a bit as far as providing interesting and fun things to do within that context? Absolutely. But to me, there's no denying that it was a very ambitious idea and one that Rare ultimately pulled off. And I should also add that Rare is doing a good job of listening to fans and making adjustments and tweaks. Yeah, and I, like I said, I think when, when it launched, I said, like, I feel like this game is going to be very different a year from now. Yeah, because, like, already what I kind of talked about when it launched, which was, hey, let's have, like cooperative creature hunts they're coming like mm. all the stuff that we had kind of talked about at launch they were like hey we'd like to see this it should have that all that stuff is on the way now so i think see if these are going to get to a good place but to me definitely one of the more innovative products that came out in 2018 definitely brave absolutely maybe some people would say stupid <laughs> those two are not exclusive to nope. one another. yeah <laughs> It's a fine line between bravery and stupidity, yep. no matter what you're talking about. Okay, and then our winner for the most innovative game or innovative product of 2018, and we both have the same choice, mm. Nintendo, Nintendo Labo. 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 Labo, Labo. At first I was like, can I give Variety Pack the winner and then runner up the robot one? <laughs> like, but then I, remembered you, uh, I rem then I remembered Yoku's Island Express. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly the most innovative product of the year. Yeah. It, I would argue that it wasn't the most successful from either a, 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 a financial standpoint or... No, a, I mean, it did okay. I, I think it, as far as I know, it did within expectations. Yeah. Um, you know, they kind of intended it as more of a separate learning product sort of branch. Yeah. And uh, it seems to have done that. Nintendo finally has its third pillar. Woo! <laughs> I was going to knock it over with a cardboard robot. Now the connectivity is gone. We have to come up with a new one. Now we get cardboardivity. Yeah. But the first time I saw Labo, I was just blown away. Like, mm -hmm. it is literally just one of those things that you're like, you know, only Nintendo would have ever thought of that. <laughs> like, and maybe yeah, other companies would have thought about it, but they would not have the balls <laughs> wouldn't have made it out of the to meeting. actually yeah. produce it. Yeah, you're, you're back up against the brave versus stupid thing. Exactly, there. yeah. <laughs> And I think that's innovation kind of in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah. The also, fine line. ballsy to charge me that much money for cardboard. Yeah. I got to give you that. Hey, but, but um, kudos to Nintendo for bringing yet another one of Pactor's uh, prophecies to life. 
where he yeah. said that Nintendo <laughs> fans would pay for cardboard if it had Nintendo's logo on it, and he was and right. Here we are. And here we are. Uh, the games ultimately so far have been disappointing. And I think the jury's still out on what kind of support we're going to get long term for this. But the actual concept and the idea behind it is like mind blowingly awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, do I? Am I going to play it again? No, no. But like, you can't deny that this is like nothing else on the market. And I'm also not it, and so it, old. And it works. Yeah, I'm also, also works. not so old where I can't remember what it would be like right. to be a child and see something like this and to destroy that fishing rod in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I would put it together first, right. and then i destroy it. Uh, as a kid, I could see that this being, like, the most memorable thing yeah, that you played all play. year. Switch play. That's, their, that's the, the pillar here. Play. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's, yeah, I guess that is what it is. But uh, both of us agree, Nintendo Labo, the most yeah. innovative thing this year. In a year that wasn't actually ripe with innovation in yeah. general, I would say. I mean, at the very least, it's the weirdest thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have an award for that. Maybe we will next year. Uh, next up, our next to last category, most anticipated game of 2019. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we get back for the holidays, we'll be doing a uh, sifted countdown of the most anticipated games. And of course, with Game Face, we will do a big 2019 year preview uh, to kick things off for next year. But for now, we're just picking two games. So what's your runner-up for most anticipated game of 2019? Runner-up is Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, the which from is software pretty is much game. mandatory as a Dark Souls fan. I realize it's not really a very Dark Soulsy game. It turns out um, it's being more directly compared to something like Ninja Gaiden. That's good. Um, but uh, that's a good comparison. Yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah. At this point, I will play pretty much anything these guys th- these guys throw at me, and I think it looks really cool. It is interesting how long From Software has been around. Yeah. And nobody cared about From Software for the first, like, mm-hmm. 20-some years of its existence. Well, especially since they were, I mean, they were basically making Dark Souls as Kingsfield I know, before. I, know. I mean, that's... Nobody picked up on it, yeah. yeah. It just never resonated until it got a little bit better production values, I guess. I don't even know, because Demon Souls is... <laughs> it wasn't a looker. No, no. What is it that set it off? I wonder. Well, part of it was Dark Souls uh, most... Fans would say that Dark Souls is a better game than Demon Souls. Well, yeah. Um, and also, Dark be. Souls was not just a PlayStation 3 exclusive. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. That's so. true. In an obscure PlayStation 3 ex- exclusive. I remember we, we saw be- it at TGS and yeah. they like, laughed at it. Well, I'm, <laughs> so did Sony. So Ryan much. Stevens did, and Ryan Stevens is now the world's biggest yep. Souls fan. I mean, Sony published it in Japan. Yeah. And, or was it? Yeah, and they didn't yeah. even want to touch it, and it took Atlas to bring it out here. Yep. Absolutely. And now they won't make a remake. It's like one of the most re- requested remakes in existence. Is they're Demon holding Souls. all the cards now. They're like, yeah. oh, we'll do what we now want. Now they're not even coming to E3. We may never see this thing. <laughs> uh, my runner-up for most anticipated game of 2019 is my winner of most anticipated game for 2018, <laughs> and that is Anthem. It has dropped down a notch for me. Last year it was my winner. This year it's my runner-up. I think that's actually kind of encouraging, though, um, because we thought it was coming out this this past year. It did not. Um, and a lot of times that makes that kind of turns you off to a game. I'm still mm-hmm. really excited for Anthem. Like really, really. More time excited. can only help a game like this. That's true. I mean, as so. far as this final quality and everything, yeah. it's only going to get better. But my hype level hasn't really changed that much, despite the fact that it's been delayed and it's had mm-hmm. a bit of a rocky development cycle and there's been some controversy here and there. I am still really, really excited for this. I had the prospect of getting into like the alpha like a week and a half ago. And I was just so excited, and as it turned out, the person did not have an extra code. They had reached out to me, and I thought that they were saying, hey, I have an extra code for the alpha. Do you want in? And I was like, hell yeah, I want in. And then they're like, oh, no, I don't actually have a code. <laughs> I was just telling you that in case you wanted to talk about me playing it on Game Face, <laughs> that's not what he said. But basically what he's saying is if you wanted a heads up that, so that you knew people were playing it already, here it is. So... Uh, I'm still really jacked up for Anthem. I, I don't care what anybody says about Bioware or anything else. This game, to me, looks freaking awesome. That suit doesn't look like it smells very good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but that's a testament to the game, yeah. right? You looked at that, you're like, man, that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have not lost hope uh, for Anthem. I'm still really excited for it, and we don't have much to wait much longer to find out yeah. if I'm an idiot. I would say not. that's more of a giant question mark to me. Maybe yeah. most curious it would, it would win for me. I just don't. I want. I just don't know what I'm going to think about that game. Now, here's the big surprise to me, Matt. 
your winner for most anticipated hmm. game of 2019 is Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown. I saw it. It blew my mind when I saw that. Matt. <laughs> Literally, I mean, it didn't surprise me that much because we're different and you like different stuff than I do. But that still was a shocker to me. Yeah, I love planes. I love all the Ace Combat games. I've been waiting. I mean, the Ace Combat 6 came out, what, 11 years ago? Yeah. Like, that, that series has been gone forever with the, you know, Assault Horizon was garbage Call of Duty wannabe stuff. And yep. then, like, Infinity was fine, but it was, a free, it was very free to play and very, you know, grindy. Wasn't all that interesting. This is a return to form. It's got three, I wish it had more, but it has the three VR missions that I'm super interested in. Apparently they're very good, even though they're very, they're somewhat short. Um, and I love the ridiculous, over-the-top, cheesy, you know, Japanese soap opera style stories that these games have. Uh, and it's coming right out, you know, it's right at the front of the year. So uh, it's, it's kind of top of my list right now. Wow. Um, and it looks gorgeous. Like, it looks great. And pre-orders, you get, like, backwards compatible versions of five and six, depending on which platform you're on. I'm a big Ace Combat fan from back in the day, back when uh, it was called Air Combat on the yeah. PlayStation One and Electrosphere and all that stuff. And so yeah, like I'm I'm excited to see. You this love game a franchise. You haven't got it for a long time. I can absolutely see yeah. why it would talk. But Devil May Cry fans are excited. I'm surprised you did not pick the game that I am about to pick. My most anticipated game for 2019 is Star Wars Jedi: Fallen Order from Respawn. Well, I can tell you why I didn't pick that. Why? Uh, a I don't know anything about it, so I can't be excited about it. There's I don't some know what information out there, though. Is there? Yeah, they're like they're saying it's uh it's Force Unleashed that doesn't suck. So not Force Unleashed. Right. Well, <laughs> like, they're saying the design is similar to right. Force Unleashed. But... I need to see that before I get any hopes up. And also, I'm not 100 percent convinced we're going to see it next year. The, I again, that was another thing I looked up today. And EA swears holiday 2019. Respawn swears holiday 2019. Okay. <laughs> I'll put it to you this way, Matt. I'm not drafting it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not with EA the way I've been burned by EA in the past. I'm not going to draft it. I'm just telling you that as of right now, that's when it's scheduled to come out. All parties involved are confirming that that's the case. And dude, a Star Wars game made by Respawn. Sure. I, I, ah. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, when I was thinking about this category, it did not even enter my mind. Really? No. That is a, that game doesn't exist to me until I see something. Fair enough. Because I'm very picky about my Star Wars. I get it. And, I am too, but I'm also a and sucker. It's, and it's not like it's not like EA hasn't dropped the ball already. That's so, true. Yeah, but we'll see. this is different. It's I respawn. Have, I have faith in respawn, but respawn still got to answer to the master. Yep. The Jedi master, the Sith master. Really, it's EA. So I forget. All right, we've come to the moment, folks. It's time for us to share our game of the year for 2018. Uh, we do have a runner-up for each one of these, and then we ultimately have a winner. Matt, what is your runner-up for Game of the Year 2019? The runner-up is Spider-Man, um, which hasn't really been mentioned a lot today. It has got short-shrifted, absolutely. It got kratos It did all get night. kratos yeah. Um, but I really love this take on Spider-Man um, overall, the universe and the character it's himself. Um it turned out, uh, I mean, I always had faith in this game because of Insomniac, but it actually really did turn out better than I even thought it would. That's my hope with um, Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah. <laughs> I trust the studio. I love the IP. Please knock it out of the park. Sure. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> don't, make the, don't make the lightsabers nerf bats this time. How about, yeah. how about just that? Um, but, like, I enjoyed every minute Me of too. this game. I love like, this it's, game. It is... Love it, love it, love it. The, I... I I go back and forth between this and Arkham City as the best superhero game ever made. It really depends on what hour you ask me a little bit. Um, I haven't been super impressed by the DLC, but like yeah, I haven't that, either. that base game is phenomenal. And it has some new perspectives and new ideas for some characters. Some of these characters have been around since the 60s. Yeah. And uh, it made some of them feel real fresh. Uh, and I'm extra impressed by that as an old school you know, comic book fan that... You know, and this is not just true of this game, but a lot of Spider-Man stuff. But like, I'm always amazed that Spider-Man still has a way to surprise me every now and then. Yep. And um, just as a property, just as a character, and Insomniac did that constantly in this game, and I love that. Um, it's it's a pristine piece of work in terms of just the action and the combat, 
and the, the writing is is uh, well above par for for, let, for a superhero game, let alone. Oh, it's mind blowing for a superhero game, um, especially a superhero that's been so thoroughly explored as this one. Like yeah. the fact that they had some new ideas and some new takes on these characters that I think, in in large part, were better ideas than what's happening in the comics right now. That may or may not be damning with faint praise, depending on your opinion of current Marvel. Um, I think it compares favorably to any of any adaptation of Spider-Man in any medium ever. Uh, and uh, certainly, like, I don't know. I wonder, I wonder how, like, the people that used to handle Marvel's contracts and Marvel's games from the Marvel side during the Activision era, like, do they look at this and think, like, wow, this is what we could have been making all this time? <laughs> I don't know about that. But, uh, this is definitely using bleeding edge tech and all that. So. Yeah, but you could. Oh, I mean, that was always there if you wanted to care and not hand it off to a, to a, a you know basically a, a sweat house like yeah. uh, like Activision. So I, I'm happy it turned out the way it did. I'm glad it was crazy successful the way it was, uh, which I I never had any doubt on it. But like it even broke the highest I think highest sales expectations Sony had for it. Yeah. Uh, so that seems pretty safe bet we're going to get one or two more of them. That's so, good news. So uh, bring that on. Okay. And maybe next time it will be Game of the Year. Yeah. Because th- it has the potential. No question. Absolutely. Um, my runner-up, and I will say that choosing this game over Spider-Man was the hardest decision I made throughout the entire Game of the Year awards mm. for 2018. Not just for this category, but in general, it was a recurring head-to-head confrontation that I had to choose between. And I can, and I chose this game over Spider-Man, but it was very hard, and that's Red Dead Redemption 2. It's my runner-up for Game of the Year. And look, obviously I'm not without complaints for this game, but man, what this game achieves and the way it pushes the medium into new directions, and maybe there are even directions that I don't like or care for. I mean, to be honest with you, yeah. they may not be. But the bottom line is this game is going to be hugely influential. And I think we're going to see little elements of this. I don't think we'll see anyone ever clone it because no studio is ever going to get eight years to make a freaking game. Mm -hmm. They show you what you can do with eight years. But I think we're going to see little parts of this, little elements of it, trickle down into other games. And you're going to see in reviews, in previews, hey, it has this one thing that's kind of like Red Dead Redemption 2. Hopefully that is not in relation to its multiplayer mode, but and instead it's single player mode. But there were so many moments that have stuck with me from this game. Even, you know, a month and some after I finished it, I still find myself thinking about this game. And to me, that is, I don't know, probably one of the, the better ways to judge a game's impact over the long term instead of sort of having a recency bias, as we often do when we do these awards even with games that just came out in March or whatever. Um, it's so polished. Uh, the attention I've talked about the attention to detail several times throughout this episode. Um, the character development. I cared about the people in this game. I rarely do care about characters in video games. I loved Arthur. Um, the ending had major impact for me. Um, it was hard, The hardest part for me, Matt, in selecting this over Spider-Man is that gameplay is the most important thing to me in video games. And Spider-Man's gameplay destroys the gameplay in this game. But the other parts of Red Dead Redemption 2, in my opinion, were so far superior, not just to Spider-Man, but I feel like even in some, in some ways the game that I choose for Game of the Year, that I, I just ultimately had to, to put it in the queue over Spider-Man. It was tough, man. Like, really... Like, Spider-Man and Red Dead, to me, are, like, 2A and 2B. Hmm. Like, I would be fine if, like, I woke up tomorrow and someone said, Shane, you gave Spider-Man runner-up. I'd be like, that's fine. I I totally would be okay with that. But just a couple small things with Red Dead 2 put it over Spider-Man for me to uh, seal the runner-up nomination Hmm. from me. Yeah, Red Dead, in comparison, Red Dead 2 does not make my top five. Wow. I enjoyed a lot of stuff way more than Red Dead. I agree with you on the presentational and technical elements, and I think little bits of Red Dead systems are going to be lifted for future games for yeah. years to come. Um, but it was not one of the things I had the most fun with this year at all. Um, but, like, man, I never got tired of looking at it. Yeah. Never got tired of listening to it either. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's that time, folks. It is time for us to announce our Game of the Year for 2018. 
18. And this is a case where Matt and I, in fact, I think last year we had the same game as well. But yeah. we had the same yeah. pick this year. And the game of the year for 2018 is God, God of War. War. Yeah. It's the best game of 2018. Yeah. <laughs> like, I didn't know when, we, when this first showed up, I didn't know if, like, it was going to be able to survive the rest of the year. Yeah. In my number one slot with yep. Spider-Man coming and Red Dead coming. And they kept coming. And all they kept, they kept, kept, kept coming. And nothing could topple this. No. Yeah. It's just perfect. It, it's like everything about it. Like, I played, like, I, I loved Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but it was too long. Mm-hmm. And there were parts where it was drawn out. Um, same with Red Dead. I like Red Dead, but the, the combat and the gunplay and everything in it is kind of janky. And, and, and so I, I, couldn't, I could not give a game that has mediocre to worse gameplay game of the year. I just couldn't do it. Um, God of War is the whole package. Every, there is not one weak element in this game. Mm-hmm. Not one. Not one. Nope. I cannot think of any weak part of this game. I can't remember the last game I played through. All, the whole game... 100% all the other stuff and then all the side content and post game content all you know everything and when I was done I kind of didn't want it to end but I also felt like I'd had enough it like was the, perfect the like, length of it was perfect yeah. and the, the way the I systems was... all bubbled up the, the, it did get a little top heavy at the end like mm-hmm. I could see where they tuned the game for people who aren't quite as good at, at games as we are mm-hmm. but but the post game took care of that absolutely yep and the Valkyries and the and that the, I can't remember the name of the place it's on the poisoned that that oh. maze yeah, yeah yeah that thing was I, I was like oh I'm gonna hate this suck I don't like games things like this this is gonna, gonna annoy me I played that part for like four hours yeah. like the first time I got into it and like you get oh I got this what is this oh it makes this arm oh this armor lets me last longer and the thing okay it just the way it all unfolded uh, you know the, the stuff that's there specifically to challenge you and like really make you push the, the combat to the next level in the way that you don't have to just to complete the story I just Phenomenal. love like getting better at the game and like yeah. cracking open my abilities and getting better with other parts of the combat engine so I wasn't just yeah. leaning on the axe all the time or learning how uh, learning to use uh Atreus better. Right. Like I, it took me a long time to start incorporating him. And that was interesting him. because I started using him immediately because I got in this weird boss battle where I couldn't win <laughs> and I was using him to stun the mm. enemy. You had breezed through that battle so you had never been kind of forced to use him and I remember after a couple days I talked to you and you're like, yeah, I'm just starting to use I'm like, oh, I use him like every fight and then mm. the next time I talk to you about it you're like, oh yeah, I'm starting to integrate him now too. Like, And again, you don't have to use him at all but when you do, you can do so much cool stuff. And again, the story resonates with me personally because of the stuff that I've gone through the last couple of years. But I think for anyone, the story's great. And I think anyone can relate to it because you've been a son or a daughter. You've had a dad or a mother. Anybody can relate to the story and also you've, and the conflict. And also you've failed yeah, at things. Yeah, absolutely. Like part of it is about you know Kratos trying to do this thing he has no idea how to do, which is raise his, this son to be a good person. Yep. And he he and he knows he's not a good person, so he doesn't know where to get the template from. But he's doing he's doing what he can. But that's why he's so folded in and 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 withdrawn at the beginning is because he doesn't want to break this child. That was a great part it's, about it too. What you just said about how he's trying to raise his son to be better than him. Yeah. But all the way through the game, he's struggling with this fact of how can I tell him? And even the son brings it up at certain points. Like what you're awful yeah. and you're telling me how to be a good person and kratos struggles with that i mean just every part of this game was great every single part of it you know we've lauded red dead redemption 2 for like detail attention to detail. that's in this game too by the way yeah there's all kinds of little cool stuff in this game hidden in the visuals in the animations it's it's game of the year 2018 i don't think any other game came close to be honest with you it was an easy choice for mm-hmm. me uh, like I said, runner-up was tough. I felt like for different reasons, Red Dead and Spider-Man, you, you could kind of pick either one. Uh, but God of War, to me, clear in a way, winner, best game of 2018. Mm-hmm. So there you go. There's our Game of the Year awards for 2018, folks. But before we go, we're doing something different this year. Um, we usually don't even run a trailer of the week during our Game of the Year uh, episode, but we are this time. And not only that... While we do it, we are naming our trailer of the week for the first time. And of the so, year? trailer of the year. Yes. Yeah. What did so I say? The week. The trailer week. Oh. 
Yeah, we're naming our trailer of the year for the first time. So, best trailer of 2018. <laughs> Every other episode, we have not told you what the trailer is. <laughs> we're naming it now. Yeah. And, uh... We name it George. And the award for the trailer of the year goes to Beyond Good and Evil 2 Cinematic Trailer. Eating your miraculous space chili. Any thoughts? Well, I have no idea what you mean. Our food is healthy. Mm, invigorating. Captain to crew. Dead monkey in the crow's nest. I repeat, monkey down. El space chili strikes again. Copy that, Captain. Hey, Paige. Bet we could use your space chili to overclock our engines. Negativo, mi amor. Only you can melt my circuits. <laughs> uh, keep laughing, fools. The key ingredients to good cooking mm, is love. We are dead in the water. I repeat. Main engines are cursed. Nox, come in. What have we got on the scanners? Jack shit. Nada. Hey, 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 wait. I see something. Three o'clock starboard. It, it's massive. Hey, get back here, Shani. Hold off! <laughs> There you go. Trailer of the year. You feel okay with that pick? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Trailer's awesome. I watched, I don't know, about 40 trailers in the last couple days. <laughs> and that way, as soon as I saw that one, I was like, oh yeah. Like, how did I even forget? Like, I should have known mm -hmm. that that was a trailer of the year right away before I wasted all my time. So there you go. That's our trailer of the year, which is something we haven't done before. Um, before we get up out of here, we are not going to answer questions today. I'm sorry, guys. I should have mentioned it before uh, we did the trailer of the year, so I apologize for those of you who put uh, questions in the chat. Um, I am doing a couple episodes of Ask Shane Anything. You guys ask great and a ton of questions. Um, so there's going to be a couple episodes of Ask Shane Anything going up once I'm gone. There's going to be Pactor Factor is going to continue to roll, and there's going to be a couple more surprises. I have been killing myself for the last like week and a half getting content uh, ready to go for uh, while I'm gone. So it's all scheduled. It'll go out on a schedule, and we'll alert you on social media whenever the stuff goes up. But we are going to have content up throughout the holiday break. Not a ton, but we're going to have some stuff. Um, so I hope you guys appreciate that. And you watch it. I know you're going to be busy with the Christmas holiday and everything. Um, 
So keep an eye out for that. And before we go, I actually have one more thing to do. Sam, can you turn down my mic, please? Uh oh. Merry Christmas, Matt. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> yep, let me plug back in. So. I got Matt a Christmas gift. Actually, we all got Matt a Christmas gift because if I bought something, you guys actually <laughs> bought something because without you, I have no freaking money. So we got Matt a Christmas present uh, to thank him for opening up his home to us for at this entire year. I'm going to get choked up. <laughs> uh, it's really been awesome what he's done for Sifted and for the site and for you guys for us to be able to keep Game Face going. Without him, I don't know what I would do. So I really appreciate him, and I hope he likes his gift. So Merry Christmas, Matt. Well, thank you. Are you opening this, I assume? And I did not wrap this, by the way. This was my wife. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think you know how to tie My it. wife is really good at this. You know and I was like, I want knot. the gift to be awesome for Matt, so would you please wrap it? And she was more than happy to. So <laughs> I probably should have brought a pair of scissors. I got it. Uh-oh. That's great. Lego Voltron. <laughs> yep, there it is. This is, no kidding, the only thing on my Christmas list this year. You told me, Matt. Yeah. I don't know if you remembered, but you said on this show that all you wanted for Christmas was Lego Voltron. <laughs> and as soon as you said it, I was like, ding! Boom! <laughs> well, that is, well, that is no small thing. Thank you. You're and welcome, Matt. Thank, thank you, because you. you gave him the money. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. So it's awesome. like six different that snap yep. together into one gigantic it's all, robot. It's all five, all five lions, and they combine. This was from a, an actual fan who made a Lego Ideas uh, thing. It was, it's like a you can creators, create creators ideas and you submit it, and if enough people vote for it, uh, Lego will consider making it as an actual set. And they did, and they actually went out and got the license and did the whole thing. It's funny because when I went to buy it, I kept thinking that it was like fake. Yeah. <laughs> because it yeah. doesn't come from like where Lego stuff usually comes yeah. from. It comes from like these more like underground like toy companies. And I was like, I, I was like, I don't know. He said he wanted Lego Voltron. I don't know how they could get it wrong. Maybe they're spoofing it. And it's finally, I was just like, screw it. I'll buy it. If it's wrong, I'll send it back mm -hmm. and then we'll get the right one. So there you go. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome, man. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Merry well, Christmas, everybody. Voltron was needed once more. <laughs> that's right. Uh, some of the people watching me don't even know who Voltron is. Oh, no, Voltron's big on Netflix now. So. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I forgot. So that's it for Game <laughs> Face for 2018, folks. It's been an amazing year. I cannot leave uh, for 2018 without thanking you guys again for everything that you've done this year, supporting sure. us on Patreon. Those of you who have stayed on our old subscription service all this time, uh, the people who have bought shirts in the last couple weeks just to be nice and help us out. Um, I, I could go on and on. Vincent has been freaking amazing, a total rock star this year. Um, just Sam, it, it's just been an awesome, awesome year. I'm so thankful for so many people and so many things uh, in 2018. Um, it's been a tough year for us. Uh, it's been a tough year for me, but obviously, relatively speaking, it's been pretty easy. <laughs> if I look back across the last couple years. Uh, but having you guys there and knowing you guys have my back has made a world of difference. And that includes uh, Sam and Matt as well. So, like I said, there will be content going through the site while I'm gone. Not as much as usual, but uh, hopefully enough to keep you guys satiated until we get back. We get back in January. PAX predictions episode will roll out right in the first week. We'll do our, our big 29 preview, 2019 preview here. Um, and we'll get ready and get you guys set for 2019 we're going to have a sifted summit again in the first month of uh, 2019 where we all get together and talk about the future of the site the future of the content i have a lot of ideas about what we want to do and how we want to do it and how we want to change things uh, we've learned a lot uh, in the first year on patreon and we're going to apply that uh, to the future so thank you guys it's been an amazing 2018 mostly because of you without you guys this would all just be for nothing so Thank you so, so much for all your support on YouTube, Sifted, Patreon, 
Twitch, all these platforms you guys come out to and support us. Uh, some of you maybe only make it to one. We appreciate you no matter where you get our stuff. If you're watching it, if you're supporting us, you guys are freaking awesome. So have a very safe, very happy, very fun holiday season and a very safe New Year's Eve. Make sure you take an Uber. Do not drink and drive. We want to see you guys in January. So much love. We'll see you on the other side.